lives on those things, Mishpaha, that really, you know, could be put in the trash bin. Really, they really have no relevance. We worry ourselves to death. Literally. We literally worry ourselves to death. All of our energy, all of our frequency, all of our, you know, power is placed on the negative side of the tracks and not the positive. You see, when you begin to dwell more on the positive side of the tracks, when you begin to think more positively, and your thoughts and your and, and your desires become that of, of, of positivity, then you'll find that you have there's no room in the house for those negative thoughts. Thus, negative thoughts manifested in negative things that you do. Thus, your actions are negative. You don't, you don't want to be that kind of person. You don't want to be that kind of person. And then ascribe to be a disciple of the Master, of Jesus of Nazareth? You can't be that kind of person. God forbid. See, that's the difference between those that just say it and those that are executing and living it and, and, daily. So that's where we are. The beauty of this gift of life. How to truly live it. How the Master Jesus of Nazareth desired for us to live it. How he lived it. Many people say, what would Jesus do? But how many people are doing what Jesus did? Come on, let's face it. So, you know, let's let's learn from that. And uh, I truly give thanks for all our leaders that have been placed in this great shepherd nation here in North America and across the world as well. They've been put there for a reason, Mishpaha. We, we may not understand it. And I'm pretty sure you do not go through six days of labor without somebody here, especially here in North America, you know, speaking negativity about our president. Make yourself not a part of that. Just say, we don't, I don't understand what I don't understand. <laughs> I'm not here to understand that, but, you know, let's, let's try to look at, let's, let's have respect for the position. Of presidency, that's a high position. We must respect that position. And at the end of the day, God put him in that position. It's God's will. Do we? God forbid. Do we want to go against God's will? Oh, I, I, I truly don't. I don't want to go against the will of God. My whole life is centered around obeying and doing the will of God, as Jesus of Nazareth said. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heavens. Do the Father's will. I'm not trying to go against that. So, let's consider these things going forward. Prison ministry is moving on great, Mishpaha. America, they're in their great festival days now, and their holidays. So, you know, the mail has kind of been slow down and it always does this time of year requests are still coming in for books from the inmates because they just don't realize and understand what they have before them so oh rabbi I need more books so that I can really understand I need this book but you have the Torah you have the hidden truth Hebraic scrolls complete edition you have the hidden truth Hebraic scrolls Torah but I need more books. I need this book and that book so I can really fully understand. Sometimes, and I wrote this down, I think it's important to understand. Sometimes we are in search for deeper understandings of God and His kingdom that we forget to master or do. Not or do not even 
even see the simple. We forget the master of the simple, and we forget sometimes we don't even see the simple. So time, so many times we try to dig so deep that we neglect the surface. Y'all forbid. I do not want that to be any of you. That's not my desire. You, you, you're digging, you're digging. Oh, I want to understand. I want such deep understandings that you're forgetting what's even on the surface. You neglect to master what's on the surface first before you start going into the levels. You don't even know how to love. You're cussing out your neighbor every day, but you want a deeper understanding? You don't even respect your, your wife. <laughs> you don't honor your husband, but you want a deeper understanding? Master the surface. Master was on the surface. Compassion, love, humility, meekness, lowliness of heart. Need I say a love again? Make your world a better place. Don't contribute to the chaos. Don't add fuel to the fire. Make your world a better place. How do you do that? Ask yourself that question this day. How do I make my world a better place? You see, because you're going to notice in our history, you know, Yo Yosef went into Egypt. Did Yosef not make Egypt a better place? Think about that for a minute. <laughs> Yosef went into Egypt. Did he not make Egypt a better place? You're here in America. Are you going to make America a better place? You see, think about that for a minute. You see, because most people that think they understand the Torah, think they're under the confines of the Torah of Moses, the books of Moses. They'll tell you, we need to break out of this prison, America. Just like Joseph, he was incarcerated in prison. The Torah tells us a full two years. <laughs> when his full two years were complete, some folks, the same way, they, they're here in this shepherd nation, this great nation of America. Oh, we need to bust out of here. We need to bust out. This is prison. We need to bust out. Learn from Yosef's situation, Mishpaha. See, those that think they're clued up on the Torah. They're too busy trying to dig deeper for understanding that they miss what's on the surface. You all know our history. Did Joseph have to break out of prison? I was watching this little elf show or some little Christmas show, right? And the elves built this little gadget. And, you know, because Santa Claus was in prison, Mishpaha. Oh my goodness, Santa Claus is in prison. So they have to bust Santa Claus out of prison. And so the elf, he made this little gadget. He put it on his hand. He, made, he put it on the man's hand. He said, look, with this gadget on your hand, you can unlock any door. <laughs> that was pretty cool. A gadget to unlock any door. So he put this gadget on this man. He said, hey, you go this. You're going to bust Santa out of prison because you have this gadget. And it can open up any door. Did Joseph have to have that to get out of prison? Joseph waited his time, and he was released from prison. He was released from prison. We must wait our time in the nations, and then we will be released from the nations and brought back into the land. Until then, learn from Joseph. While we're in these nations, we're to do good to these nations. We're going we're gonna to get into that in a minute, but I think that's important to understand. Most of these people here in North America think that we must leave America. America is the great devil. We must get out of here. This is the Babylon. This is a great shepherd nation, and I'm so I'm so happy and humble to be a part of this great nation. Priest of Israel, I only know two. And guess where one of them was relocated to? 
the shores of North America. If America is so bad, then why are the priests of Israel, the Kohanim, here in America? Why? A Kohi. Why is he here? America can't be all that bad. <laughs> right? Think about it for a minute. But again, Mishpaha, here's the issue. Many people don't understand. They don't have the revelation of the Kohim. They don't have the revelation of the laws of Moses. They don't have a revelation of truly who the Master Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, was. So what do I do with these people? I love them. I respect them. I respectfully disagree with what they say, but I respect them that they have, that, you know, they, they just don't have the revelation. I don't segregate myself from these people. I don't run these people under the bus. They just don't understand yet. Maybe they'll never understand. I don't know. But I'm here to show love, compassion, humility. I'm here to help them if I can help them. I'm here to encourage them and lift them up, raise them up. Not to tear them down. Not to be haughty, but to be humble. This is what we're here to do, Mishpaha. In these great nations that we're in. Because I can pretty much guarantee you there's nobody in this room right now that's in Israel. Some do come in here from time to time that are actually their domicile is Israel. They're in the land. But most of us are, we're just like Yosef. We're incarcerated and we're waiting for our time to when our incarceration is, is, is done. But while incarceration, you, while incarcerated, you can still be raised up to high positions by being what? In service. Can anybody give me another word that's synonymous with blessings? Well, what does blessing mean to you? That's a question that I have for you. I know it's early. You probably have it in your morning coffee or your morning tea. I know I'm drinking my tea right now. But what does blessing mean to you? What does, and more important here, here, here's the question. What does being a blessing mean? What does it mean? See, now we get into the meat and potatoes of how the Master Yeshua desires for humanity to live. And just like you heard, you heard it from the Kohen himself in lectures past, he told you, it is not God's will for his for his for humanity, his creation, to be apart from him. How are you going to create something and you want to be apart from it? How many of you, you create a child, a son, a daughter, and you want them to be away from you? You don't, oh, <laughs> you know, yeah, I created you. Now I, I'm, I'm done with you. I don't want to see you ever again. No. You always want that creation that you created to be a part of your life in some way, shape, form, or fashion. Now, some people that I noted here in Texas, they take that to the extreme. <laughs> You got grown men still living with mama. <laughs> you know that. Now you you you, you got to distance yourself sometime and start your own family and and move on and carry on in that aspect. But you know, with mama and daddy always in the back of your mind. You know you, you, you but you got to move on. You, you can't you can't stay under mama's breast forever. You must move on and and and, and start the cycle again. How many of you have this thought process? Yael, woman of the ten, says, be less of self and more for others. That's what she thinks, her understanding of what blessing really means. You need to ask yourself that this morning. There's no wrong answer, Mishpaha. But truly, what does, what does being a blessing mean? Too many times we focus on the deeper we dig in holes and we just we can't stay on the surface and really master the surface I want to be a master of the basics <laughs> I want to master the basics I want to master love I want to master master compassion I want to master kindness I want to master consideration I want to master humility I mean if you Make, make that a part of your affirmations. I want to master humility. I want to master kindness. Think about these thoughts going forward. You know, let's, let's, let's think today. We need to be more thinkers. We need to start thinking. 
We get in these nations and we get fat. We don't even have to be in the land to get fat. We get in these nations and we get fat. Because Siri can do everything for you. But we need to begin to think. Put Siri to the side. You, you must begin to think. You know, you need to learn something for the tech savvy. For the people there in Silicon Valley. You better learn from them. You know what they do with their children? They don't give them devices. <laughs> their children. These are the people that make these devices that all of us have. Their children don't get devices till they're in their teens. They don't get these devices. All this social media here, there, and everywhere. And these are the people in Silicon Valley raising their families. And they don't give them these devices. What is that telling you? That they're trying to teach their family members, their children, how to master the basics. Communication. Isn't that a basic? How many of you want to master communication? Oh, no, Rabbi, I don't need to master communication because I could just text. I could text you real quick. I'm so happy and humbled to be able to have conversations with, this, with, with the Kohen. And quite frequently we have conversations. We talk. I like that. Sometimes I can't talk or he can't talk for whatever reason. We're busy with other things, but we, then we text. But we have to be careful not to fall in the pitfall of just being texters and, and we forget to talk to people. Look them in the eye and talk to them. Shake their hand. Is it said of you that you're a nice fellow? Oh, he's a nice fellow. Learn from President George W. Bush's life. He said, no, I don't have time to sit here and talk about myself. I'll let others say about me. What do others say about you? Think about these things going forward. Learn from our rich history. You see, what you if you're here in this room, you're not here by happenstance. What you're going to get in this room, you know what you're going to get? You're going to get the, just like it said in the title, the unadulterated Torah here. You're going to get the the how-to, how to live your life just like the Master Yeshua, the Master Jesus of Nazareth. How to live your life. Think about that going forward. So I say Happy Hanukkah to all of you. We're still in Hanukkah here. This end. Happy Hanukkah to all of you. And truly, understand the reason for the tradition. And don't go through rote with the tradition. But understand, how do I continue to let my light, if you like your Hanukkah candles, how do I continue to let my light shine? How, how do I keep it continuously lit and luminous? How do I do that? And it requires you better in yourself daily. The attributes of our rich heritage as the Hebrews as the Jews, whatever name you want to put on it. At the end of the day, people should be able to look at you and say, oh, he's a believer. You notice. You notice what I said. He's a believer. He's a believer. Do they say that about you? Oh, I, I look at so-and-so. He's a believer. Oh, I look at so-and-so. She's a believer. She's a believer. She didn't tell me that she believes, but I can tell just by the way she lives her life. How she carries herself. How she treats me. She's a believer. If we put you in a lineup. Santa Claus was in a lineup because he went to prison. <laughs> he was in a lineup with a bunch of other guys. Put you in a lineup. If somebody would say, okay, I want you to, the guy on the other side of the mirror saying, I want you to pick out all the believers in this line. Will that person that you know on the other side of that mirror say, oh, this one is a believer. You see, we forgot how to believe. We forgot how to believe. We didn't forget how to believe. But we, we've, for the most part, forgotten how to believe. And even with the Santa Claus, people are having so much debates over, oh, do you ch tell your child that there's no Santa Claus? I would say, hey, tell the children that there's a Santa Claus. 
You know why? That instills belief in them. They're believing in something that they didn't even see. Think about this now. How many of you were, were, came up and were taught that there was a Santa Claus? Anybody? Put up a capital S if that was you. You see, because I want you to learn something today. Too quickly, we're here to shoot down, you know, uh, lessons in life. Put up an S if that's you. You were taught and you, you, you were brought up that there was a Santa Claus. You 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 put up a crimper tree and you was waiting on Santa Claus. You left him some cookies and some milk, and you was brought up that Santa Claus is coming to town. Saint Saint Nicholas, whatever name they give him these days. But as children, that help you believe in something that you can't see. Think about it. Think about it. So then, yeah, I'm pretty sure when you realize that there was, how many of you, when you realize that there was no Santa Claus, your heart was literally broken? Mine wasn't. I was taught that there was a Santa Claus, but when I understood that there wasn't no Santa Claus, that didn't break my heart. But you know what that did do? That instilled belief in me, to believe in something that I can't see. So when it came to Jesus, when it came to the Messiah, Yeshua, I never saw him, but I believed in him. Think about it. I think it's healthy to believe in things that you can't see. Because that instills in you belief. Wow. I'm trying to master faith. I'm trying to master belief. So if your children want to believe in Santa Claus, I'm not going to shoot them down. Do you know, when you start doing that to children at a young age, that can affect them. That affects them. That affects their growth process. When everybody around them has this belief, when their peers have that same belief, little children, yeah, Santa Claus left me this. And yet you tell your son and daughter, oh, there is no Santa Claus. And all of a sudden, they're, they're like, wait a minute, but I'm going, little Johnny's telling me he got this from Santa Claus. But my mama said there's no Santa Claus. You see what that can do to them? That affects them. Let them believe, I say. Let them believe. And then one day, when they do come into a revelation of the Torah, of the Master, Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, they'll, they'll, they already have it in their background to believe. Their foundation is to believe in something that they never saw. To believe in something that they never fully understood. But they had a belief. Oh, he's a believer. Wow. Wow. Can we not learn from that? My goodness. Make this world such a better place. We can make this world such a better place if we just but begin to believe again. Begin to believe. Don't let your mind play these Jedi mind tricks on you. But begin to believe at whatever level that may be. You got to start your belief level out somewhere. Then it'll mature and it'll grow from there. If it's watered properly. And if it's cared for properly. So we keep it moving forward. For the Master Yeshua. For the Master Jesus of Nazareth. And we live our lives. We light our candles. And we live our lives after the true likeness and the true light of the Master Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth. That's what it's all about. So when you see your neighbor blowing up his electricity bill because he's got all these lights on his house, you say, Baruch Hashem. You say, oh, I understand now. He's a believer at some level. Maybe he don't believe the way I believe, but he is at a believe he's a believer at some level. And I'm not gonna run him under the bus. Light your light. But more importantly, live your light. Show compassion and love for all. If you can agree to disagree, still get along. 
and still love one another. That's what it's all about. Without any conditions. Well, I'll love you, but mm, uh, I, 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 uh, uh, con 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 condition, condition. Um, I'll love you only if you love me back. Only if you're nice to me, I love you. I'll treat you the same way you treat me. Wow, what is that? <laughs> what is that, Ms. Baha? But yet, many have this mentality world over. World over. So we must understand that. We're told by the Master Yeshua that He came for the children, for the lost sheep, for the scattered sheep of the house of Israel. And as I was watching these services with President George W. Bush, you know what I saw? Wow. Yes, he came for the, 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 the scattered sheep, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But that effect affected the whole world. Because now there's believers. Many believers in the Master Yeshua. Do you see it? What a beautiful thing. What a beautiful thing. That's the effect that you have in the nation. Yet many people are telling you, oh, we must leave the nations. We must, we must go. We must segregate ourselves. We must lock ourselves up as the children of the books. As the children of Israel, we must do this. We must set ourselves apart from these people. No, we're to live, we're to live our lives with, with, with all of humanity and, 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 and prosper in these nations. Can anybody tell me what happened to Joseph while he was in prison? Can anybody tell me what happened to him? <laughs> Joseph was in prison and he was given the prison keys. Can you believe that? <laughs> Go figure. Go figure, Ms. Baha. <laughs> Go figure. What a wonderful what he was he was the he was the prison. He he ran the prison. In prison. But he's supposed to be a prisoner. Do you see the beauty in that? It's just so beautiful. Yet many people today, they think they're in prison. Even in prison, you can still have the keys to the sale. You can still be, you can still be large and in charge. <laughs> you see? <laughs> you can still be large and in charge. Truly favor, Rabbi Yosef Yotin. Favor. And that's what all of you have as well. As you think you're in prison. But you're in these great shepherd nations. I know there's a lot of things going on all over the world. Especially Oliver. I was thinking about you the other day, Oliver. My goodness, I'm looking at Paris, man. That looks like that looks like WrestleMania going on over there in Paris, France. How many of you seen that? It's all on TV. I'm like, my goodness. <laughs> my goodness. But you, you, you must realize, with, with great... With great power comes great responsibility. And you must do right by the people at the end of the day. You must do right by the people. You, we need to take that and we can water that at the lower level. Is that we must do right by the people that we come in contact with. We must do right by them. We must be just and we must be fair. And we must not show injustice, but we must show justice. We must show love. To all people. And don't try to hoodwink people. Honest people working very hard for their wages. And you, 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 you know, you can't take from an empty well. <laughs> you know, we've got, you know uh, this, is, this is, is important. So I think it's very, very important for us to understand this. To show love, show compassion to all. All people. And be just and fair to all. Because when you're not, you know, people see this. And, you know, you're not treated fairly. You see, you're trying to divide classes. The rich get richer and everybody else, yeah, well, fend for yourself. That's what makes America so beautiful. It's a melting pot of what? We all, unless some of you in here are Native Americans, all the rest of you are just immigrants. Hakohin to be the first to tell you he's an immigrant. 
I'll be the second to tell you that I'm an immigrant. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm an immigrant. But yet, just like the president of former president of Canada said, he said the United States of America is the most greatest nation that has ever been placed on the face of this earth. This is a prime minister from Canada saying this, ex-prime minister. And I would have to tend to believe with him. I, I totally agree with him. I'm a believer. So you wonder why the son of Aaron, the priesthood of Israel, is brought to the shores of North America. Think about that. Just heard last night on the news, the business news, that America, again, is still producing more oil than even Russia. We at the number one position. Russia's number two. Guess what Saudi Arabia is? Saudi Arabia is number three. Oil, oil production. You see, remember, it goes back to the point. To whom much is given, much is required. So you have to do right by that requirement. You've been given much. Much of you is required. Much of much of you is required. Well, Rabbi, what's my requirement? Your requirement is to love, show compassion, be considerate of others. Many come through this room with a bunch of just rambling. Blah 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 blah. blah. What happened to consideration? But you say you love God. You say you love Jesus. You say you want to be like Jesus. Are you kidding me? Put you in that lineup and they're definitely going to say, oh, he's not a believer. I saw him on the street and he kicked me in the, in the knee. Then I bent over and he kicked me in my backside. Oh, he's not a believer. You see? Truly, we have a lot to learn. And I'm so grateful for this and humble for this gift of life that we have the opportunity to learn how to have the mindset of our very creator that breathes into our nostrils. How to have the mindset and follow the footsteps of the master, Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth. It's an opportunity. Opportunity is before you this day. What will you do with it? How are you going to make yourself better today than you were yesterday? What are you going to do with it? In these great shepherd nations that we're in. So that's where we are. I would encourage anyone in this room, if you'd like to give esteem to the Master Yeshua, you'd like to give you know, praise to, to the very God that we serve through our actions and our deeds, please text in your message. Or if you want, we give you the mic and you can give, give, bring forth your miracle, the great workings that have happened in your life these past six days of labor. I wish you all a happy Hanukkah. Enjoy your, you know, your tradition of Hanukkah, festival times. The Master Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, celebrated Hanukkah. He didn't celebrate a Christmas, though, but he celebrated a Hanukkah. So, Festival of Lights. He celebrated that festival. And, you know, I, 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 I look at, you know, my neighborhood... And I say, wow, they, they, they're taking Hanukkah to the extreme. And I say, Brooke Hashem, you know, you got Light City over here at night going on in my neighborhood. I don't know how it is for your neighborhood, but my goodness, they put on a light display. And I say, Brooke Hashem. I say, I give thanks to God for their belief level. And something that they didn't see. See, I'm going to always try to keep, I'm going to keep it positive. <laughs> Regardless of everybody around me is negative, I'm going to be positive. And I'm going to see the positive in everyone around me. Every person, every plant, every animal. I'm going, to, I'm going to see the positive in it. Every tree. Everything that was created by the Creator. That's how I roll. And I can, I'd, 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 I'd highly recommend that you get on the same train that I'm on. Roll that same way. Then truly your lights will shine. Truly, you'll make your world a better place. Truly, you will. Shabbat shalom to you, Rebbe Benia. I think it's important to understand. I'm going to turn it over to Hakohi. And uh, we'll learn. Learn these, these lessons. You see, we're going to stay on the master the surface.
Quit trying to get all of these deep understandings. Okay, Rabbi Benir, Rabbi Benir would like to testify. Torah 1 free says, I give us thing to Abba Yah for life. For giving the strength to keep pushing forward, no matter what I have to endure. Oh, indeed. See, because that's in, that enduring is what's going to make you even stronger, to push even stronger. To be able to move your rock. You're going to be able to move it. You're going to be able to lift it up and play Harlem Goldfrider with your Lord, with your so-called rock that cannot be moved. Oh, it's going to be moved. It's because you're, you're being strengthened. Be strong. What are we told by Moshe, by Moses? Be strong and be strengthened. Ruka Shem. Okay, Rabbi Benil, over to you for a testimony. Shabbat Shalom, uh, Rabbi uh, Kifa, Hi Kohen, or Hi Kohen, Rabbi, uh, Chief Rabbi Kifa, Rabbi Morem, and Ms. Baha. I just want to get a warning if everybody can hear me okay. <clears throat> okay, great. Great, wonderful. Well, uh, I just wanted to, to, to give esteem to the Abba, to the Father in Heaven, for traveling mercies, first of all. Uh, as Kohen was traveling, I was traveling also, and... Uh, I just want to give a testimony specifically about my travels back from Germany. I was in Germany for a week with my uh, with my Aisha, and I'd already sent this over to Ha Kohen. And as we were traveling back, I sent him photos as well as video footage. As we were traveling back from uh, from Germany, coming back here, I'm in Tobago right now. Uh, we had just taken off. It's probably about maybe five or ten minutes into flight. And uh, we were reading, you know, reading from the book of uh, Bereshit, Genesis, uh, chapters uh, tw 32 to like 34. And uh, I just looked out the window there to my right, and I saw a rainbow. It was a circular rainbow. Now, the thing is, is this, is that the plane was casting a shadow into the clouds, and the rainbow was encircling our plane the shadow of our plane. But not only was it a singular rainbow, it was a double rainbow. And then, my, my eyes are signaling right now. <laughs> That's right. We looked at the video again this morning. It was actually three rainbows. So, uh, circular. All three of them were circular. So, it was a rainbow within a rainbow within a rainbow. And uh, I just give a steam to the Abba for that, for actually witnessing that, because I had never seen a circular rainbow in my life. And uh, we both, you know, broke out and prayed and just thanked the Abba. And, uh, you know, our number, uh, one of our numbers, I should say, is three. And uh, as I look at her even right now, I say, you know, if you have two threes, right, if they face each other, that forms an eight, right? <laughs> so two threes kissing <laughs> forms an eight and if you lay that eight on the side that, uh, that's the infinity side so I just give praise to the Abba to the Father in Heaven to uh, to uh, the Master Yeshua to the Enhopma the set apart spirit of Yahweh for, uh, for his wonderful wonderful uh, uh, favor that he's given unto us and, I mean, I can give story after story after story, but, uh, you know, we'll save that for another time. But uh, ha happy Shabbat, everybody. And I just wanted to share that with everyone. Shalom, shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom, Mishpacha. This is Rabbi Simon Asa from Florida, Pensacola, Florida. Okay, Shabbat for that, uh, Rabbi Bonaya. Yeah, I saw, I saw that... Uh, the video that you sent in the pictures, uh, I think that was a that, that was a very auspicious sign. Uh, it was definitely a sign from the God of Heaven and Earth that we serve, and it was a sign of protection, a sign of blessings that was that was shown. You know, that was great. That's great. Baruch Hashem, Master Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, and the Master who is revealed to the flesh of mankind. And you know, as you know that. Uh, uh, we are right now in the middle of uh, Hanukkah. Uh, some believers like to see this as a festival of light. I mean, it is a festival of lights, and some believers like to see this as representative of uh, Jesus of Nazareth as well. So that's right. You know, it's it's festival of light, 
and um, if you celebrate it, great. If you don't celebrate it, great. You know, <laughs> it's not a biblical commanded festival. There is no Torah commandment that says we have to celebrate it. However, it arose out of the history of Israel when the Maccabees brothers, if you, you know, have the, those longer versions of your uh, Bibles, which include the uh, the pseudographia, you know, the extra books in the Bibles, and the Maccabees brothers, you know, they fought with the, the Grecian army in Israel. So this story is really representative of that. Is uh, this was uh, commemorated as a remembrance for that time when uh, Israel could not uh, do the Torah. They were prohibited and uh, prohibited at the behest of death, where you know women and children were massacred because the Jews were told not to not to recite the Torah. So the half Torah was born. By the way, if you don't didn't know that the half Torah was born during this era when uh, the, the, the Grecian, the people from Greece were ruling Israel and they would prohibit them from reading Torah. So what the Jews started to do is they started to read the prophets, which is called the half Torah, not half Torah, but it's half Torah basically meaning that they were studying portions of the prophets that were really the Torah, <laughs> because the prophets only utter in the majority of the, if you look at the writings of Isaiah, Jeremiah, they pick out of a lot of themes that come out of the Torah itself, the first five books of Moses. So that's why the Jews were doing those instead, because they were not prohibited, and uh, in a way they were studying the Torah still, but in a roundabout way. So that, so this uh, festival of lights uh, really represents that era, and I guess, you know, when the Master Yeshua came on the scene, he said that I am the light of the world. So, you know, a, lo a lot could be said about it. And there's a lot of tradition woven around the, the, the menorah and the, 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 the oil, etc., the virgin olive oil that is used in these lamps. A lot of tradition is woven around it, but I would discourage any traditional reading or traditional understanding because they're all, they're all uh, how should I put it, politely. They're all legendary accounts. They're not true. So, so, for instance, one of the traditions that there was only one uh, vial of oil in the temple, and then that lasted eight days, is not true. Uh, that that's a tradition. It's it's a false tradition, by the way. So, uh, a lot of the Jews they they today may teach that to the children, but that is absolutely a fake as it comes. So, let's not let's not glorify the fake. <laughs> Let's glorify what is actually true and factual. And what is true and factual is the fact that the Maccabees brothers, who were uh, a tribe of Levi, they were Levite clan, my poor family in a way, and, and they basically, what they did was they fought the Grecians. They, they stood up. In a time of need of Israel, they stood up and they fought back. They said, we're going to fight back. Because, you know, we're not going to allow us to be, our people to be put down. But let me, let me give you a little bit of, of a Levite history there. At this point in history, you know, Judah, Judah is always depicted as a lion. As you see it in some churches, they show Judah as a lion and synagogues as well. But at this point in history, <laughs> I look back at that, sometimes I kind of smile. The lion was like a cat. <laughs> the lion. The lion was Simba. He was like subdued. He was subdued by the Grecian army. He didn't know what to do, the poor little lion. Guess who came to the rescue? We came to the rescue. My family came to the rescue and put ourselves forward and said, we are going to fight for Israel. We're going to raise the army. We're going to fight. So the tiger came forward instead. So, <laughs> so the lion right at that point was just Simba. You know, like, meow, meow. <laughs> he said, you know what to do. So any time in history, in our history, whenever we've been into trouble, and you can look back over the pages of scripture, whenever we've been in trouble, only one tribe has risen up. That is not even counted as a tribe. That is the Levites. They've always risen up. In times of trouble, Levites come on the scene. I, I mean, they might be obscure. Other times, you may not even get mention of where the Levites are. They might be all over the place and hidden away in some bush, you know, in some jungle and 
suddenly they come on the scene. When God calls the warriors, then the Levites come. And the Levites come to raise Israel, they come to encourage Israel, they come to raise up the fallen. Our tribes of Israel, they come to raise them up and encourage them and to stand up for God. That is the role of the Levites because they are the teachers of God. They have always been the teachers of God and they will be teachers of God for the remainder of the humanity, you know, irrespective of what goes on. So this is great. Now, now coming back to coming back to today, uh, uh, some of you came in late. I think that maybe uh, many people don't know that we start our classes now, 7 o'clock Central Time, 8 o'clock Eastern Time. That is, 8 o'clock New York Time is our class start time. So please mark that in your calendars for next week because uh, Rabbi Kiefer did have the room open promptly around about, I guess, uh, you know, around about uh, 7.30, 7.30-ish uh, on the Eastern time front. So, uh, so note that 8 o'clock is our start time for, for our future runs. And, uh, you know, those of you in the European front, I mean, it's easier for you because you're four hours or so ahead of us. So, you know, you'll be mid-afternoon. The reason why we did this because there are certain people that, are, you know, work as nurses and doctors and, you know, other, other line of duties. And some of these people have to go to work in midday. You know, like 12 o'clock today, some people will be heading out to do their uh, Saturday shifts. So, I think that this time frame that we've chosen, the 8 o'clock uh, Eastern time, it works really well for those people because they can attend class and then they can, you know, have something to eat and go to work. They need to go to work. So this is why, and, and for the other people, the whole meaning of Sabbath was to have a Sabbath rest with your families, with your wives, with your children, to sit down with them, to talk about the past. And, you know, this is a great time. Hanukkah is a great time for us to talk about our history, what happened, how God rescued us. What God, what miracles God did for us. This is a great time for us to talk about that. Even if you don't celebrate Hanukkah, I think it's a great time to, to talk about that. And uh, so, so therefore we, we do that. And also, you know, Christmas is, Christmas is coming up uh, around the corner. You know, everybody at this time of the year is, uh, you know, is, is going to be celebrating Christmas. Now, I know some of you... Some of you might be critical. Some of you might be, well, Christmas is not biblical, and you know, Christmas is not the birthday of Christ, etc., etc. You know, some people, some people are critical like that. But I, I would, I, I would discourage, I would discourage critique. I would not encourage you to be critical. Why? Because uh, the reason why I say that is that it is, it is better not to be critical because you live in a in a world like, you know, you got this little pond of yours in North America. This is a little pond of yours. You live in this little pond like a goldfish and you don't know what's happening around you, around the world. You know, where there's other ponds as well. Which, you know, all all of these kind of ponds go into the sea. So, or this, this you know, this little, uh, imagine, right, that you're this little goldfish that lives in a, a little pond and, uh, and the goldfish doesn't know what's going on elsewhere. So, this is how people are over here, they can become very critical of uh, traditions of uh, the nations and one such tradition is Christmas. Now, I want to put forth a case in which you might understand that why it is actually okay for people to celebrate Christmas because, you know, people have asked me before and they have said to me, Rabbi, can I attend Christmas dinners with my family and I've always encouraged it that yes, you know, go, go and sit down with your families, sit down with your parents, and you know, honor your parents. Go sit down with them and eat with them. They gave you birth. So therefore, you know, I always encourage it. And when I, when I went abroad, when I was in Pakistan recently, I came across this, this Christian family, and they were talking about the fact that they're going to put a Christmas tree up in their home and they said that their neighbors, who are Muslims, they're going to help them to put this tree up, and then they're going to put some decorations on there and lights and stuff. And 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 they said that, you know, they they, they said something which was so very relevant, and so very few people over here even understand that. They said that this is the only witness we can make 
to our neighbors. Imagine, right, living in a populous nation of Muslims that actively persecutes Christians. You know, because all they need is an excuse. You you drank from a glass, you know, in a in a in a place, right, where they have water. Like, you know, you're going on the road and there's water there in in a place, and there's a glass there, and 50,000 other people are drinking from it, and you happen to drink from it, and you're a Christian, and they'll persecute you for that, and they'll say you've defiled our glass. That's what I'm talking about. So to that nation, these people are forming a witness using Christians, and I was like. You know, I said, yeah, I understand that. I understand that they 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 want to do it for that reason, and uh, and they they know that they know that it is not the birthday of Jesus of Nazareth. They know that, but the reason why they do it is because they want to just formulate a witness. And now they can't do a verbal witness. They can't openly preach because it's not permitted. It's not permitted to 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 teach about or talk about the Bible over there. In fact, the Prime Minister of Pakistan himself is, I would say, he's anti-Jesus. Period. He's not he's not in favor of Jesus in any way. And in his speeches, in his speeches that he gave recently, he didn't quite speak favorably of Jesus of Nazareth. You know, he speak he spoke favorably of his prophet, his belief, saying that it's historical. What a what a what a lie that was! Historical, my foot. It was not historical at all. Muhammad's existence, Muhammad's existence as a person, is of no historical consequence really, because there is no history that such a person existed. And then he said that, oh, there is no history of Jesus, hmm. while there is some history of other prophets in the past. So he kind of spoke about Moses, you know, having a historical basis. And and he tried to relay that Muhammad had a historical basis, but the facts on the ground are that as much as Jesus was a living person, or as much as Muhammad was a living person, actually Jesus was spoken of by some historians, whereas Muhammad wasn't. No one, you know, in history near his time, and we're talking about, you know, we're not talking about Muslim historians. We're talking about uh, non-Muslim historians, no one, un- no one spoke about him. So really, the 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 glove is, you know, on the wrong hand. This this is a typical ignorant attitude of a prime minister of Pakistan. But I'm not surprised by that. I'm not surprised by it. Absolutely not, because I, you know, what can I say? You know, all I can say is that ignorance begets ignorance. So when people like that. Who call themselves educated and speak ignorantly? Uh, well, so be it. Well, no, he wasn't the greatest man on the earth to live. He was greatest to you. He wasn't greatest to me. He was probably the worst man on the earth that lived because he eradicated and killed, massacred three Jewish tribes in Saudi Arabia that were peaceful, that had no problems with the, the people around them. So he was the worst person to live for those three tribes. And by the way, they were my, they were part of my clan. So. So your, you know, your bragging is all, all just nonsensical, and I'll and I'll relieve you of your duty, of your nonsense. So this is this is the point: is that it's very easy to you know to to cast a a shadow or a doubt on somebody else, and then try to raise yourself higher. However, we want to speak about this a little bit. This is why I said that you know we we brought up in a culture where sometimes. We can be very critical of other people's beliefs, and I'm talking about. I'm not talking about beliefs in such of Islam or, or Hinduism or something like that. I'm talking about Christianity, Christianity's traditions. Some people can take a real hard-nosed attitude against it. That you know, oh, Christmas is no good, and we shouldn't do it, and blah blah blah. I would say the contrary, because I have seen that in a in a a populous Muslim nation. That was the only way Christian families could witness to the nation of Islam. That you know, there is a, there, there is a there is God. You know, there is a light of the world, and His name is Jesus. But they can't say that openly. If they said that openly, my goodness, they'd be burning their houses down. So this is why I'd encourage you to, especially those of you who have parents, brothers, and sisters. I am pretty sure during this time that your parents are going to be inviting you to dinners, 
and uh, your brothers and sisters and family and friends, I highly encourage you to go there. I highly encourage it. Highly encourage you to go there. Don't worry about, oh, is it kosher, is it not kosher, because as you know, that you have been taught that that majority of what's called kosher is, 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 is according to the Torah, <laughs> is not even mentioned in that particular way. So it's all uh, agenda-based and, you know, it's not even true. So therefore, I would encourage you to, to look at it from a completely different point of view and try to understand Christmas from another person's angle because every person that God has created, you know, God, man and, and woman, man and woman are created in God's image. Every person has a light of God. Every person. Now, don't, don't be critical and say, well, only those have the light of God that follow Torah. No. Every person has the ability to do good. Every person has that ability. Now, whether they do good or not, that's their choice. And Rabbi Kippa is saying that people are very merry at this time. Awesome. And yes, they are. And, you know, you're going to have a lot of people being happy. And I'd encourage you to, to at least understand it. And, you know, I always respect. I've always been respectful. The day I came into the faith of the Master Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, I've always been respectful to people, you know, for Christmas, because I, under, I understand it, that they're trying to honor the Lord, the Lord God, the one that we call God. And so we have to, we have to really, you know, be respectful to that. And <clears throat> now coming back to our, uh, our joke, uh, kind of a funny joke, I don't know if you get anything out of it spiritually, but you may get something out of it, but here we have one. Uh, we had three pastors, three pastors and a drunk. Uh, there was three pastors who were driving down the road when they missed a turn and went into the ditch. As they pulled themselves together, a drunk pulled up and asked if they were all right. Uh, oh yes, Jesus is with us, one replied. The drunk thought that over for a minute. Then he said, well, you'd better let him get in with me. You're going to kill him. So there you have the joke. Now, our Pasha today is Pasha's Miketz, which is Bereshit 41, Genesis chapter 41. We will look at that in a, in a second. And uh, I think it's, 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 it's an imperative that we look at that because that gives us some very important information and understanding of our history and our timeline. It's, it's very encouraging. Always, whenever you read the book of Genesis, I mean... I mean, I do. I don't know about anybody else, but I get very encouraged when I read the book of Genesis because it sets the whole stage for our history. You know, from the beginning, it sets our stage because it means right, that that we know where we began from, where we came from. So very important. Now, Rabbi Benaya spoke about this, uh, this uh, uh, you know, this journey in the plane. Where he, where he was uh, given this rainbow, and the rainbow comes out of the book of Genesis, chapter 9. So it's, it's very, very important that we understand. Uh, and the rainbow is a covenant, is a covenantal sign. And uh, Rabbi Benaiah, for your information, that was a covenantal sign. So you were given a covenant sign by God that you are in covenant with Him. So we, we all, all of us, that believe in the God of Israel, personified, in the Master Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, we are in covenant with God. And I, and I, uh, my goodness, you know, I can guarantee you that a lot of people don't even understand what that really means. Because it's very, very powerful to be in covenant with the maker of the universes. This is not just some, you know, Joe on the street. This is a maker of the universes that we're in covenant with. And wherever you are, whichever country you live in, he can reach out to you in, in a covenantal sign. You can call on to God, and He can reach out to help you. you know, whether He helps you through His angelic beings, or whether He, he sends a humans, you know, to assist you, He can assist you. That's actually great. Uh, that's actually so very good. Now, coming back to uh, Genesis chapter 41, there's two things I want to cover. One thing I want to cover is this, this Genesis 41 about dreams, second thing I want to cover is about love. Now, 
Genesis chapter 41 starts with, And it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream, and behold, he stood by the river. Suddenly there came up out of the river seven cows, fine-looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them out of the river, ugly and gaunt, and stood by the other cows on the bank of the river. And the ugly and the gaunt cows ate up the seven fine-looking and fat cows, so Pharaoh awoke. He slept and dreamed a second time, and suddenly seven heads of grain came up on one stalk, plump and good, and behold, seven thin heads scorched by the east wind sprang up after them, and the seven thin heads devoured the seven plump and full heads, so Pharaoh awoke, and indeed it was a dream. Uh, night came out in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he saw Egypt dream, but there was no one who could interpret them for Pharaoh. Then the chief cupbearer spoke to Pharaoh, saying, I remember my faults this day. Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, both me and the chief baker. And we each dreamed a dream in one night. He and I, each of us, dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now there was a young man with us there, an Abrahu, a Hebrew, a servant of the captain of the guard. And we told him, and he interpreted our dreams for us, each man according to his dream he did interpret and it came to pass as he interpreted to us so it happened I office and the baker was hanged then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph and they brought him quickly out of the dungeon and he shaved changed his clothing and came to Pharaoh and Pharaoh said to Joseph I've had a dream and there is no one who can interpret it and I have heard it said of you that you can understand a dream to interpret it. And Yosef answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me, Elohim will give Pharaoh an answer of shalom. Then Pharaoh said to Yosef, Behold, in my dream I stood on the bank of the river. Suddenly seven cows came up out of the river, fine looking fat, and they fed in the meadow. Okay. I'll stop, I'll stop over here because I want to explain the details in this particular passage. A lot of the information in that passage is missing. When I say missing, I mean that there is a lot in that passage that hasn't been said by the writer of Genesis, being Moses. He hasn't put the details around it. Now I just want to paint some more details around it. Number one is that when, when Joseph was in prison, and when he was, when he was going to be brought to Pharaoh, Pharaoh was having these dreams. And Pharaoh wasn't just having these dreams one or two times. He was having them recurrently. And because they were occurring recurrently, he was really troubled by them. So when he calls his magicians, his wise men, they were having trouble identifying what the dream actually was. I mean, they gave him some solutions and answers, but Pharaoh knew that their answers were wrong. So Pharaoh wanted a, a more concise answer to understand the dream. And therefore, this other guy... The, the butler, you know, he happened to be there and he was able to then tell the Pharaoh, there is a man who can interpret the dreams and his name is such and such. Now at this point, Yosef is a Hebrew man. Now there was a tradition in Egypt that in order to go to the Pharaoh, Pharaoh was always sat up on a throne, but the throne had to be ascended by 70 steps. So the tradition was this, that in order to ascend, the 70 steps, you'd have to speak 70 languages. At each step would be a language, and you'd have to speak a different language. You could come up to Pharaoh on the 70th step and speak to him. You could not stand at the same level as the Pharaoh. It was permitted, especially for a slave, especially for somebody who was, you know, classified as a slave in case of Joseph. He was a Hebrew slave, and he definitely wouldn't be permitted. So what we are told to our uh, other writings that you can acquire, we were told that he, he was, he, an angel came to him at that point. And an angel came to him and taught him the 70 languages. When he taught him 70 languages, the Joseph sent it to Pharaoh one step at a time, spoke all 70 languages. And that's what surprised Pharaoh. So you know, you might say, well, how did Pharaoh believe him? Well, Pharaoh wasn't just going to believe him. When he saw this man speaking 70 languages, oh, he definitely his ears perked up. He wanted to know about this person, what he knew about his dreams. So what we learn about this, we learn some important information. 
Here he also tells Pharaoh what the dream means. He tells him that you're going to get seven years of plenty and seven years of lack. And the lack years are so lacking that they're going to eat the plenty years. But then he presents a plan. You see, Joseph was a leader. And he had leader qualities. He was a visionary. Every In every time and space and era in our lives, we are always going to be given leadership, you know, people with leadership qualities. God is going to send people like that in your life. Those people are going to be visionaries and they're going to be leaders and they're going to lead you. Now, I will tell you one thing about about my past. When I was a young kid, uh, when I was a young, young lad, uh, years ago, I used to get these dreams. And I didn't understand what they mean at the time. And I used to get a dream like, like, you know, I'm leading, a, I'm leading people, I'm leading tribes. And I used to get dreams all the time, I'm leading tribes and I'm leading people and I'm someone and I don't know who that, I mean, I didn't know what that someone was. I was a leader basically in, the, in these dreams and I was leading people out of something and they were being led out into some other area of, of I guess, you know, freedom, prosperity, success. And I was like, what does these dreams mean? And I was young, I was maybe... You know, and I'm talking about when I was like six, seven years old, I used to get these dreams. And uh, then, you know, uh, I, asked my, I asked my mother, you know, about my birth, and my mother would tell me that how, in what circumstances I was born, and when I was born that my father left to England three months later, and that I was a very auspicious child. You know, we, we have this thing in our, in our culture, and in biblical culture too, is that you can have children that are auspicious special children. They are specially born and suddenly things start to happen for the family. You know, family starts to get prosperous, maybe business improves, maybe something else happens. So the, the adverse can be true as well. Like a child is born and suddenly the father's lost a job and, you know, the, the income has gone downhill. And so in the culture I came from, the East, there are two types of cases. The adverse, the negative case, where they say that child is cursed, you know, he's born and she's born and all these bad things have happened. Then there's the other case where an auspicious child is born and everything, the family starts to get blessings, they start to improve their lives, they're prosperous, and people say that's an auspicious child. But one thing that I, I remember distinctly was that uh, my, mother, my mother used to say is that the shadow of God is upon my son. Now, I didn't understand what that meant at the time, the shadow of God is upon my son. But later I understood the shadow of God is upon my son, meaning that I had the hand of God upon me as a child. And it is actually true. <laughs> it actually is true as well, because I, certain things happened when I was young. And I didn't know what, what they were, but I, like I told you, that my family suddenly prospered. Suddenly, you know, my dad went out, we acquired a house, you know, suddenly, and my dad became prosperous, and things just happened so fast, and so my family knew, you know, the people around my family, the women would come into the house, and we would impact them with young little kids, and they would say, you know what, that kid, that son of yours has got a shadow of God upon him. Women would say that to my mother as well. And uh, and they said, yeah, there is a shadow, there is a shadow on him. So as I, as I, because I, was, I grew up as a very quiet child, you know, I wasn't a, I guess I was naughty like other children, but when I grew up, I separated myself. I wasn't like, you know, in the middle of everybody else. I separated myself and I kept myself separate and I would just, I would just stay, you know, on my own mostly, you know, stay in my own house, stay in my own room and do my own little thing, you know, do my cooking in the house and stay inside mostly. Apart from the fact that when I started to do Taekwondo, came out, the warrior side came out, but then, you know, again, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to separate myself. I didn't want it to be with the people. You know, you know, there's a lot going on in those days in England, you know, there was like a lot of kids were into drugs and it was a drug culture and drinking and going out and all that. But I was, in my family, I was the one that I would always separate and I wouldn't want it, I did not want it to go to those places. I did not want it to go places where there was kids hanging out, you know, dealing in, in, in drugs or drinking and all that. I said, no, it's not for me. I would just stay away from it. So I kind of kept, kept out of that line. That limelight wasn't for me. I stayed out of it. And so I grew up out of that. You know, years later when the Master called me back and I, and I went to the Master Yeshua, 
I learned, you know, who I really was and what my purpose was in life. And look, you know, from England to America. And those dreams I had when I was a kid of leading people are now actually understand and see. Because I was meant to lead our people out of darkness. People of Israel, B'nai Israel in the nations, they are meant to be led out of darkness. And I'm going to be, a, I'm a representative of the tribe of Levi to do that. Just exactly as the same thing as I told you, that when, you remember I was talking about the Maccabees. The Maccabees were a tribe of Levi, and they rose up to help the people. And I see myself in the same light. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that we all have to fight a war. You know, I'm not here to fight a war with America or anybody else, for that matter. My, you know, my direction, my remit, is to lead people out of darkness, our people out of darkness into light, into proper ways of living, and to be blessed, and to be happy, and to await the return of our Master Yeshua, and to be resurrected to glory, you know, to back to Israel, back to our, our temple, those glorious days that we're going to see ahead. That's where, that's where I am sitting today. That's why God brought me to this nation, to be in the midst of the people. And if you look, the model is no different from Moses' time. The model is exactly the same. But this time, rather than lead the people out to the Sea of Reeds, Red Sea, I'm having to lead people out of the, of the Sea of Darkness. You know, the, the ignorance and the, and the bad things that our people are into over here, and the lack of, you know, and, and the lack and the depression and all sorts of problems that our people are facing over here. That's where God has placed me, really, in all essence. That's what I see. And that's what I see that what my, my childhood dreams are about that particular time in my future, where I am today. So it's very important we understand Joseph had dreams. Joseph had dreams, and Joseph's dreams were that one day he will become great. One day he will be able to help his family, then his families will come to him, and they did. So at this point in history, Joseph goes to Pharaoh and he interprets dreams. Now I want to, I want to show you another angle of these dreams. And I want to show you another angle of people as well that are around you. You have those people around you who are basically what I can only call lack, people of lack. And there are those of around you that are people of, of abundance. So what we are shown in the dream are the two types of cows or the two types of corn. One type is of abundance, one type is of lack. And so what we are seeing, and God is sending us a message, by the way, this is a message for us today as well in 2018. We're coming to the end of the Gregorian calendar. This is a message for us. Stay away from lack. Because lack will consume the abundance. It's not the other way around. You know, in the dream, it wasn't the abundance that consumed the lack. The lack consumed the abundance. I thought, my goodness, that's interesting, isn't it? That instead of the lack being overcome by abundance, actually the abundance overcame by lack. So what does that show you? Negative people around you today, Mishpaha, family, negative people around you are going to consume you if you allow them. So hear me clear and hear me good, what I'm saying. And this is the message of Torah and Scripture. And I will bring you to the Master later, Master Yeshua's words too, but he says, so what we, what we see is that if you allow yourself to live with people today that are lack people, people that lack, always complaining, always whining, oh, this is not right, that is no good, you are no good, why you do this, they are going to consume you. Why? Because they will overcome you with their lack. They have a negative nature. And negative nature is going to consume your positive nature. Why? Because if you allow, if you allow to listen to those people daily, because you know, if you live with, if you live in proximity to a negative person and you have to hear his naggings every day of a man or a woman, guess what's going to happen? It's going to bring you down. Slowly, 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 you might be a person of abundance. Slowly, slowly, they're going to overcome you and you're going to you're no longer going to be a person of abundance. This is a story that Joseph, in the book of Genesis, you know, is being presented to us. What has been presented to us, and what was the solution? 
the solution wasn't that, well, you know, what do we do? Or what are we going to do? You know, scratching our heads, you know, to the Egyptians. Joseph told the Egyptians that they had to do something. They had to have a plan. And he gave them the plan. He said, look, you need to set up those seven years of plenty. You need to save some grain every year and put it in silos, store it. So when the years of famine come, you're ready to deal with it. We can deal with the area of famine as well at that point in history. So Pharaoh said, who better than you? You're going to be the wise man. You're going to do that for us. And I'm going to, I'm going to put you responsible and you're responsible for the kingdom. You do that. You decide what silos to build, where to put them, how to do them, how much to store and how much not to store. It's your duty. From today, I'm making you that wise, wise roy of Egypt. So Joseph became a wise roy. Same way, if you don't allow, or if you allow that, if you allow yourself to stay within lack and people who lack, then what would happen is that you will be overcome by lack. So how do you overcome lack? And I had somebody write to me yesterday, a little bit distraught about things going on and things happening around them. And I think one of the one of the key issues that I saw in that person's text, uh, email message, was that they were around the wrong people. They're chasing people of lack. They're chasing people of, of uh, mediocrity, negativity, and they are, they are having a hard time because the more you put yourself in that, in that sphere, in that area, the more you're going to struggle, the more you're going to face problems. So what is the solution? solution is actually very easy. The solution was given in the book of Genesis by Joseph. What did Joseph say? Save some, save some each year. When you have the years of plenty, save some each year to take care of the years of, of non-plenty. So what does that mean in our life? Well, it means very, it means very similar things. It means that if you are right now, some of you might be in the years of plenty. Some of you may have great jobs great businesses. So it means that you should be putting away some, you should be putting away a, a sum of your money, finances, into into later years if we hit years of, of non-plenty. In other words, if we hit, hit years of negativity or if this country comes to a problem in the future and you, you and me both know that, this is a given, that there will come a time in the future when our stock market won't be so buoyant you know, we, we we will have a stock market crash, possibly, you know, I say crash, but I think the more accurate words would be correction. Maybe we have a big correction in the stock market. You know, the other day, Dow Jones almost fell a thousand points, and then it recovered some. But what happens when it Dow Jones don't recover? What happens when the Dow Jones falls 1,500 points or 2,000 points and doesn't recover? That means a lot of companies will be affected. Billions of dollars of, of, of uh, uh, stock market value will be wiped. In, in days. And so we potentially could be facing those times in the near future. So how do we prepare for it? Well, now is the time. Now America is living in a time of plenty. Believe me, right now, America for the last two years, has, or three years, last three years of America has been a time of plenty. Stock market buoyant, jobs market is good. You know, this country is oil, you know, no longer oil dependent. We are oil independent. So we are gas independent, so on and so forth, which means what? We should, be, we should be putting something away. We should be putting something away in our year of positivity and abundance. And if we put something away in our year of positivity and abundance, then later when we do hit times, when you know, times are not so great, guess what? We have that put away that now we can use. That is what Joseph's solution was. And I, and I encourage you all, all of you listening on here, that you need to do the same. At the time of plenty, start putting away 10%. 10% you give to God. Always remember that. If you want blessings in your life, a 10% should go into tithing. And the other 10%, you should be putting into investment. So what kind of investment? Well, you can choose that. You know, you can go, if you want to get advice from a financial advisors, you can do that. Or... You know, if you came to me, I'd be able to give you some financial advice in that area is where you, where you place your 
because your 10% needs to grow. You know, it doesn't need to shrink. <laughs> if it's going to shrink, unfortunately, that's not going to help. Because when the, when the year of lack comes, when we do hit those low times in the future, we are ready for it because we plan for it. So that's very important. So, uh, you know, I was listening to, uh, I think it was, uh, it may have been Napoleon Hill, uh, and it may have come out of one of his teachings that he was saying that, uh, that you, you know, in order, in, he said all the wealthy people, he was talking about the wealthy people, he said all the wealthy people, they put away 10% into investments. That was part and parcel of their plan to get more wealthier. They didn't just, you know, they didn't just spend everything. They, they put 10% away out of their income every every month or every two weeks. So whenever the income came, they put away 10% to, in, to some investment so that it grew and it grew and it grew and it grew, etc. So that that's, you know, according to Napoleon Hill, was a was a good plan for the wealthy to get wealthier. And I would say that, you know, that that plan really comes right out of the Torah. Think about it, where it came out of right out of the Torah, out of our books. People have taken information out of our books and applied it to themselves and benefited. Remember what Jesus of Nazareth said. Jesus of Nazareth said that wise are the children. He said, he said, the children of light are ignorant. He called the children of light, Hebrews, Jews, he said, you are ignorant, whilst he said the children who are from Gentiles are more wiser. So that's that's very interesting to understand as well. Is that is that the Gentiles are wise? Yes, because they're doing all these things that came out of our scripture. Yet we have our people who are acting the ignorant part. Yeah, I believe so, uh, Rabbi Yosef. I believe it's available in PDF format, and uh, I also believe that it's available in uh, audio format as well, somewhere on YouTube. So you can download it and listen to it. And so having, having said that, uh, it's, it's, it's important to understand the concept. Now, what about dreaming generally? And you might say, well, Rabbi, what about dreaming? I have a recurrent dream. Well, if your recurrent dream, as, as Rabbi Kifa was saying last week, probably you know, it was a good, good, good joke as well, that if your recurrent dream is about, about eating pizza, then there's no point for you to bring that dream to me to, to, inter to interpret it, because it may not actually mean anything. You know, there are dreams at four levels. And the first level might be that you're just dreaming you're eating pizza every Friday night. What, what does it mean? Well, it could have a meaning. If it's recurrent, it could actually have a meaning. And, you know, you're joking aside, it could possibly mean that maybe you need to set up a pizza business. And you'll get plenty of wealth from it. That could be one interpretation. However, like I said, there are certain dreams that may not need interpreting because they just come and go into your mind, you know, as you go by the day. You know, you, you ate too much pie, you know, you, you sat in the tur you know, you sat Thanksgiving dinner and you had too much turkey and you got indigestion, now you're dreaming about all these different foods, and you know, and you, those kind of dreams may not mean anything. Level one dreams are, are pretty useless, you know, they don't mean anything. Level two is where it starts to get interesting, and level three is prophecy level, and level four is prophecy level. So, level two, three, and four are the interesting levels. Level two dreams will occur recurrently and they will have a meaning to your life. And level three will be prophetic dreams. And level four will also be maybe God communicating with you prophetically. So these two, three, four levels are the, I would say sometimes level two could arise out of level one, but definitely level two onwards are what we call uh, dreams that, that are important. God trying to communicate with you and God has universal laws. You know, the universe that we live in, God has predefined universal laws, like, you know, you know the law of gravity, that's a law. It's already predefined. Law of gravity doesn't care what your belief is. It doesn't care you're a Hindu, Muslim, Jew, it don't care. It works, period. So there are certain laws that God has created in the universe that have certain meanings. So irrespective of your belief, they exist. And when, 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 I, when I would use the word infinite wisdom or infinite intelligence or universe, I'm actually re referring to God. So these are my acronyms for God as well, in a way. So when I say infinite wisdom, that is God. 
when I say infinite intelligence, that is God. When I say infinite universe or universe, that is God as well for me. So we have to understand that, that the God is always in the equation and God is always in the, in the text. Whether we see God or whether we don't see God, He's always in the text, in the equation. And His laws are predefined and they exist. Irrespective of whether you believe God exists or doesn't, it doesn't matter whether, what your beliefs are. Because your beliefs don't define laws of God. Laws of God are pen, penciled, written in stone and can never change. No one can change them. They are written and established. You know how, for instance, how a particular fish lives in the sea is a law that God has defined. You and me can't change that. That is defined. A certain kind of fish, a certain kind of fish can go into the mouth of a shark and a shark will not close its mouth. You know, I was reading about a certain kind of fish that can, that can go into the shark's mouth and the shark cannot close its mouth. Now, that's a law, that's a particular fish that God has created and designed and, and you know, by his law, the shark cannot close the mouth and eat that fish. That, I thought that was amazing. So having said that, there are things like that, there are creatures like that, there are laws in nature that God, that God has done and we can't change them. But we can use them to our benefit. So, here we, we look at the Torah, the principles of the Torah, the Bible, and we want to see where we, how we can benefit from these. And like I said, that the, one of the things that you can benefit from today's, today's Pasha, we catch, is that stay, you know, if you are, if you are dealing with negative people, if you are dealing with negativity and negative, negative issues around yourself, like, you know, there are people who are negative, there are people who criticize you for what you do or how you do things, then I think you're, it's a sign. It's a sign that you need to be away from those people because negative people will consume you. Essentially, that is what Joseph was telling Pharaoh, that the negative years of growth will consume the positive years of growth if you're not careful, if you don't wisely use those positive years of growth and save those in some particular way. So, so therefore, therefore, there are, there are ways and means. And, you know, sometimes you write and you say, Oh, Rabbi, you know, I have this problem and such and such person says this and I'm dealing with this and so on and so forth. How do I deal with it? Therefore, it's very important to understand that you can, you can deal with it very easily. How about you not be in the negative of, 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 or, you know, in the company of negative people? So that's something you have to decide. You have to decide to be not in the company of negative people. You know, you should rather be in the company of people that have uplifting views, that are not so critical, and that will help you. This is very important. It is very important to, to see that. Now, <clears throat> we, we can come, you know, we can take that forward. We can take that forward. How? Because here is something that I'm going to give you. Very, very important. There was something running in my mind. Yeah, it was a cause, uh, cause Benz. Somebody sent, I think my brother sent a video today of Cause Benz, first car. It was basically a bicycle that had a, like a motorized uh, chain in it. And uh, the bike was ridden by the wife of Carl Benz. And uh, they, that was their first Mercedes Benz, by the way, first riding car. And Cause Benz was a little critical and their car's been thought that it wasn't yet ready for the road, but his wife encouraged him and said, no, it's ready, and she took it out. She took it out and it, you know, it went out onto the road in the dirt highway, and I think halfway down the road it broke, and she took something off of her leg, which was part of her uh, height, and she just put it onto this chain, and she fixed it, and then she continued to drive this little car. Beautiful. So this woman was real encouraging, real encouraging to her husband. And I read about, I read about uh, Henry Ford, that Henry Ford's wife was the inspiration in his life. And so like this, you know, Carl Benz's inspiration was his wife. So therefore, therefore you have to remember that certain people in the life of, in, in your particular life will, will become your encouragers. Some will, some will be your detractors, some will hate you, some will dislike you, no matter what you do for them, they'll hate you, they'll dislike you, they don't like you, period. It doesn't matter. 
stay, you know, move away from those people. Don't have those people in your life. Keep the people that like you. Keep the people that inspire you. Keep those people in your life. So you need to be away from people that are detractors. Subtractors and detractors, remove them from your life. And you should be with the, in the people that are encouragers. Encouragers, encouragers to you, that encourage you, that build you up, that lift you up. So these are the kind of people that you need to be around. And so I think, I think a lot of the time, a, a lot of the time is, yeah, I mean, if you have a loyal wife, great, but some people may not have a wife. Some people may, some people are probably still single and searching for that wife. So until you find that wife that is loyal to you, maybe then you need to have friends and maybe you need to have relatives that are, are, are uplifting to you, lift you up and give you good ideas and, and, and you know, they, they build you, they don't, they don't take you down and destroy you. So my advice would be is to remove yourself from people that are destroyers, that are negative. Now I'm going to come over to Matthew chapter 5 because I love this chapter, the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is not just a Sermon on the Mount as Christians have popularized it. It is a Sermon of Torah. And it says, it says, Blessed are, are those, in chapter 5 verse 9 of Matthew, Blessed are those who pursue Shalom, for they shall be called the children of Elohim. Or, in other words, blessed are they who pursue peace, for they shall be called the children of Elohim. Who are the people who pursue peace today in our world? Let's ask this question. Who are the people that pursue peace? I think that uh, George um, W. H. Bush uh, Sr., I always get confused which one's which, but George W. H. Bush Sr. who died, I think he was one of those people who pursued peace. He was one of these types of people who definitely pursued peace. He looked at the good of everybody. He looked at the good of everything. He treated everybody with respect. And as Rabbi Kifa was telling you, he's from out of the great state of, of Texas. And he, he, you know, he has the longest marriage. I have, I have never heard of a person having 70 years of marriage. He has the longest marriage I have heard of. My goodness, what a marriage to inspire to! What a man to inspire to in our gen, you know, in our generation. I think this is a good man to inspire to, really, because he was a, a kind man. He was a good man, <clears throat> probably a good president as well. I mean, I don't remember his presidency. I do remember the presidency of his son. George W. Bush, but I don't remember the presidency of George W. H. Bush. However, you know, there were probably be people in his time who were detractors, who didn't like him, and there were people who liked him, and they did this, this special funeral arrangement for him in Washington, and then they did the, the day off, you know, the stock market was shut down. I think that was great. I think that was honorable for them to have honored this man in this particular way. I think it's great to do that to remember him and to, to honor him in that particular way because, you know, people that are good in our society, we do need to honor them. We do need to remember them. We shouldn't just put it to one side and just as an afterthought. So it was great because it, it, it will be a great blessing to generations to come who will look up to the senior Mr. Bush. So, you know, commiserations to his family. And I think he was a, I think he was a good guy. He was a great guy. I think today, today, you know, we have President Trump in the helm of, our, of of America, and a lot of people dislike President Trump. They dislike his policies. They dislike his approach. But having said that, there are other people who like him, and I do believe that Mr. President here, you know, he has a different approach. He doesn't have the typical approach of our past presidents. So his approach is totally different, and he has a different way of approaching things. And, you know, from what I can tell, some of the things, some of the jobs, he gets them done. He gets the job done. And he's a, he's a bit of a doer. And I think that we, we shouldn't be critical about our president. I, I would encourage everybody, you know, especially those of you who are uh, the, the tribes of Israel, the nice world, I think that we should pray, you know, if we are in North America, we should pray for our president. We should pray for our leaders. And those of you in England, you know, you're going through a hard time right now with Brexit. I mean, next Tuesday is a critical vote in, in, in the UK Parliament. What happens over there? So you, you people over there in Britain, you need to be praying for uh, Theresa May and your government, that God will give you wise leaders 
so that you can have prosperity in your country, and I, and, and I too will be because I'm part and parcel of that land, you know. <laughs> like, I'm also British as well, so therefore I'll be praying for both sides. And at the same time, that our people should be praying for leaders of Israel. That means me, Rabbi Kifa, other rabbis in our midst, in Texas, and other areas of America, we should all be collectively praying for each other, raising each other up, and our people should be praying for their leaders. Why? So that God can give wise leaders, God can use the leaders for wise decisions, and we may prosper as a result of that. Our nation should have wise leaders, so we may prosper as a result of that. No one wants to suffer, and no one needs to suffer. And the only way we can help is that we need to be uplifting our leaders. Now, we may not understand all the policies of Mr. Trump. You know, we, we may not understand how he operates. And some of us might want to be critical, but I would encourage you is not to be critical, but to try and understand it. If you don't understand it, put it to one side. Still pray for the person. Pray for him for wise counsel and wise decisions ahead that may benefit our people in this nation. And other nations that we are linked to, you know, we are, we are heavily linked with European nations, and you know, we are linked with Israel, so we need to pray for the people. We need to pray for our restoration. We need to pray for wise counsel in Israel. All of that we need to pray for. Right now, I think Bibi Netanyahu is, is the least of wise counsel. From what I read, I mean, they want to file a case against him of corruption. So a lot is going on in Israel as well. So again, we need to pray for wise leadership. It's very important. Rather than be critical and put people down and talk bad about them, I think it's always good to lift up the people and pray that God will give us wise leaders. That it will help to build nations, it will help to restore our people back. And I think that's critical and key. And here, Matthew Yeshua, when he was talking about peace, who are the peacemakers? The peacemakers, by the way, are people of love. You know, uh, years ago I remember when I was working at a particular place and this man had this, this, little, this little sticker over there, this little board over there. And this, look, this little board said, it's kind of funny because uh, I kind of like, like that little board, it said, make love, not war. <laughs> you know, this English guy had this little piece in his factory, make love, not war. And I thought that was, that was neat. I, you know, I, I thought that was pretty neat. Make love, not war. So we need to we need to make make peace. We need to make a lot of us probably need to make peace with our parents, maybe with our brothers, sisters, maybe with other people that we are having problems with or had problems with in the past. Maybe we need to be in that plane as well. However, sometimes it's best to be away from people and just to be you know out. Just remove yourself from people who are negative, who have negative vibes, who are crazy. Just remove yourself from those people. Sometimes it's better to do that. Now, one of the areas that our people are struggling in today greatly is the area of love. A lot of our people don't know what love means. You know, love is only used as a, a, a what you call it, like a eros kind of love, you know, where a sexual nature of love, you know, husband, wife, girlfriend, boyfriend kind of love. But no, love is much bigger than that. So a lot of our people don't know how to love because they were never shown love. You know, our people who were raised in this nation, they were raised by, you know, maybe a little bit rough, and they, they learned to be rough ahead. They learned to be rough, they learned to be rough with their wives, with their children as well, because they were treated badly. They thought, if I'm treated badly, I want to treat these, these people badly as well. So a lot, a lot of our people today are struggling and suffering in their marriages and with their children because they don't know how to love. So I would highly encourage you to learn to love. And love, by the way, love love is is, is not the, the condition of love that we are used to. Well, if you love me, I'll love you back. You see, that's the problem that we have, is that we are used to conditions. And if you love me, I'll love you. If you don't love me, if you hate me, I'll hate you back. No, we need to stop that, and we need to start understanding God's love in our lives. God's love to us, you know, it says God is love. And so everything about God that emanates is love. Everything about God is emanating in love. And we find that Jesus' death and resurrection 
And you know, it's going to be remembered now because Christmas period is when they're going to remember it the most. They're going to put up the, you know, the, the stories of the nativity of Jesus of Nazareth and people are going to be singing carols. You're going to see carol singers in the streets. Great. That's great. So we need to remember the meaning of Jesus' death and resurrection. Because Jesus came and, and died and rose again, for, again, out of love. It says, for God so loved, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only unique son. In John 3.16. So we need to understand the meaning behind that. And again, I think it's paramount that a lot of our people are suffering because they don't know how to love. And there is a problem. <laughs> you see, the problem is this, that when you go to churches, Churches give you half of the story, and the other half they ignore it. How? Because what they'll say to you is love of other people. But they don't tell you that you not just love other people, love yourself first. You must love yourself first. If you don't love yourself first, you will not be able to love the other people. We don't have enough love to give when I hate myself. If I get up every morning and hate the look on, you know, I look at myself in the mirror and I hate myself and I say, you know, I'm no good or I'm inferior or, you know, I'm too short or whatever, you know, whatever it is, I'm too fat, you know, all those kind of negative terms that we carry. A lot of, lot of we people carry those negative terms. When we carry those terms, what do you think we derive? Is that, is that love or is that hate? So we derive hate against ourselves. We start to neglect ourselves. We eat too much candy. We eat, drink too much. We smoke too much and we start killing ourselves. Why? Because we hate ourselves. So first, we need to love ourselves. Clean ourselves up. If I'm going to be love anybody else, I have to love myself first. I have to love myself first and then I can project my love onto other people. If I don't love myself, I'm never going to be able to love anybody else. I'm not going to have a happy family. I'm not going to have a happy wife. I'm not going to have happy children. If I treat myself badly, I'm going to treat them badly as well. This is a given. So the first thing that we need to learn to do is what God has taught us, is to love your neighbor as yourself. But what did Master Yeshua say? Love your neighbor as yourself. What did God say? Love your neighbor. You know, you can read that in our Torah. Book of Leviticus, you can read it. It says that love your neighbor as yourself. Commandment came from the, from the books of Moses, the Torah, and so it's, uttered by the mouth of Jesus as well. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, if I can't love myself, how can I love my neighbor? Question mark. So I have to learn to love myself first. How do I, you know, you might say, well, Rabbi, it's easy for you to say, love yourself, but how do I love myself? What do I do? It's very easy. It's not that difficult. When you get up in the morning and you look yourself in the mirror and you tell yourself that I love you. <laughs> tell yourself I love you. Whatever you are, whatever your name is, I love you, Simon. <laughs> I'm Simon, so I love you, Simon. <laughs> so you need to tell yourself that. Hey, good-looking man, how are you doing? Hey, good-looking woman, how are you doing this morning? This is how you speak to yourself. So you speak kind words to yourself. You speak love to yourself. And some of you may need to do some meditation in that area. And meditation may be that you need to speak words of love to yourself daily. Because if you don't speak those words, the problem is that you are, you are ending up on the wrong sphere, wrong side. So those, those words could be what? There could, there could be something like this, I am loved, I am wanted, I am worthy. See, these are the kind of words you should tell yourself daily. Why? Because God loves you. You are wanted by God and you are worthy because God chose you. And you can tell yourself, I am redeemed. Because God has already redeemed you. You already have salvation. So these are the things you need to tell yourself daily. You may not have another person to tell you. You know, you may not have a wife or a husband to tell you that. That I love you, you know, that you're redeemed, that you're beautiful. You may not have somebody to do that for your part. Maybe you're single. Maybe you're living on your own. So you have to tell yourself. Tell yourself that daily. To build yourself up. And then when you go out, you know, when you go out, you want to treat yourself here and there. You know, you go out and maybe you treat yourself to a Starbucks, you know, coffee or something. 
or you know you go out and you buy some candy for yourself whatever whatever way it makes you feel good maybe it makes you feel good to i don't know you know buy something that you like to buy so these are the things that you need to do you need to do those things because they will they will help your cause they will lift you up so first and foremost rather than lifting every tom dick and harry out there first lift yourself up if you don't lift yourself up you can't lift others because if you're fallen if you're destroyed and you're struggling to you know recognize who you are in this world i'm pretty sure that you're not going to be able to help anybody else either so part and parcel of the problem there are two areas that i see that you're struggling in number one is love you don't know how to love yourself number two is you're chasing after the negative you're chasing after negative people and their negativity is rubbing on you rather than leave those people in be and say okay i'm going to let you be and all i'm going to do is i'm going to pray for you it is better to pray for negative people it is not good to continuously argue with them and try to win them over by your point of view it will never work you will never be able to convince people like that the only thing that will get through to them is when you sit quietly in your room and you pray for them that's the only thing that will work nothing else will work for negative people and there will always be people who will hate you there will always be people who dislike you the way you dress the way you speak the way you act the way you hold yourself together there will always be people who will love you and there will always be people who hate you do not expect every man and woman to love you because they won't every man woman out there won't love you there will be people out there who will simply look for elements in your life and they will use that to slander you they will use that to be critical of you it's happened to me and it will happen to you as well but i would encourage you to avoid it avoid those people put them out of your life and simply sit down and pray for them because what did jesus say pray for those that persecute you pray for those people and bless them you know don't 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 sit down and say i hope that they i hope that they hit by a bus <laughs> i'm going to pray for them god i hope that you hit them so with a bus so they fall fall down and die <laughs> i hope that happens you see there's a propensity to do that the propensity is that we want to do that we say i hope you die and you're cut to cut by god and a bus hits you so that, see that that's propensity we're propensity to do that for sure I mean I have at times as well in my past I wanted to do that and pray for somebody like that but no uh oh yeah or go to hell you know you might say go to hell and burn forever you know curse you be by the name of god so very easy for us to use those words how difficult it is for us to say I pray for you and I hope that god will bless you even though you don't agree with me even though you hate me I'm still going to pray for you brother or sister or whatever that is much more harder to do is to pray for people and say you know what i know you disagree with me but i'm going to simply pray for you for understanding and i'm going to pray that god will bless you and i'm going to go my merry way and i'll say merry christmas take care love you bye gone that's the last you see of them this is this is what some of you need to do some of you need to just tell them that you're going to pray for them love them and leave them and walk away never to look back because people who are not going to get it they are not going to get it by you pounding and pounding and pounding on them they are not going to get it because they're not designed to get it that's how they're supposed to live they, are, they if they're going to remain ignorant you and me are not going to change them from their ignorance so the best thing that we can do to help them is to pray for them that's the best that we can do for them and it is very important that we sit and that we have those people in our life that help us because look what happened with pharaoh when pharaoh was about to hit a a, a good period of his life mm. and a bad period what did he do he said let me grab hold of joseph but this is a man of knowledge this is a man of wisdom i want this man to be next to me I want him part of my team. 
So Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, took Joseph. This is what you need to do. People who are wise around you, people who are of wisdom, people who are of knowledge, people who are of, of, of vision, you need to say, you know what, I'm going to attach myself to this man. I'm going to keep myself attached to this man because this man has knowledge, wisdom, understanding. I want to be part, you know, I want him close to me. That's the attitude that you need to take for yourself. And the people that are driving down the floor, you know, the people that are driving down off the cliff, you need to say, you know what, that person over there is driving down the cliff. I can see he's going to fall down the cliff. He won't listen to me. I will remove myself from him. I will pray for him. But that's the last time I'm going to say anything to him. I'm not going to tell him he's going to, he's going to go down the cliff because he will just turn around and swear at me or, or call me bad names. I'm not going to tell him that. But I will sit here and pray. Let him be blessed. As he falls off the cliff, let him be blessed. Let him go to hell happily. Let him go to his grave happily. So, therefore, you need to take that attitude. You need to take the attitude that let God deal with such people. It is not our role and it is not our position to sit in judgment seat against other people and say, let me think what should befall him. Let me see what kind of judgment is good for him. That is not good for us to do that. It is not for us to judge anybody. Because the Master is sure to judge not lest you be judged. However, it did say to love your neighbor as yourself too. So it's very difficult. In order to love my neighbor, I need to first learn to love myself. I can't remove that equation. I can't say I'm going to hate myself and love my neighbor because it's not going to work. So a lot of our people in America today are hating themselves. And they are hating the next person. So have you seen how much hatred they have for the white person? My goodness. I have seen some people who are so anti-white. And then I've seen people who are so anti-black. So this is the two sides of the equation. You know, you have the, the white supremacist and you have the black supremacist. These are two sides of the equation. So therefore we need to, we need to remove ourselves from that. Now coming back to our, 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 our Pasha, is that so Joseph we knew became a very wise wise counselor of Egypt and he saved Egypt not only did he save Egypt he saved practically every country around Egypt including Israel now would you have thought that would you have thought that that Egypt would save Israel I mean wasn't Egypt at one time the you know became the slave nation for Israel yes it did in later times but at one time Egypt was so great that they actually saved Israel. A lot of people don't look at that, and people forget that. And I think it's, it's, it's a, a rather oxymoron, isn't it? That rather than Israel save Egypt, that Egypt is saving Israel. So it's not far out. You know, today, America supports Israel and gives billions of dollars of aid to Israel. So it's not far out of the reach because America is a type of nation of Egypt a mighty nation of its time, and they are helping Israel today until our times of restoration are upon us. So it is not far to know that God has placed us in these nations where we are today, you know, in Europe perhaps, in North America, and other Western nations. So we, we, we mustn't forget that certain of us will play important roles and others may not play such important roles, but we can all be, but we can all be supporting. Even if we don't play leading roles, we can all support the leaders by prayer, by uplifting the people of Israel, spiritual Israel, in the nation. We can pray, we can uplift, we can help, we can do many things. So it's very important to do that. And as, as I said, that in your time of plenty, you see, right now is a time of plenty in, in North America. And so you should be looking at putting away some savings, some finances, so that your future in the time of lack will be taken care of. That is all about wisdom. And if you don't do that, then maybe you need to learn to do that. You know, start today, start this week. Start planning. You know, start planning that you, you, you take out 10% of your salary every month, and that 10%, after your tithe, 
The next 10% you take out is investment. Start investing it somewhere so that you build a small pot, you know, your, your little nest egg, and you continue to build it, maybe till your retirement, so that when you retire, you have a nice little pot that you can use for yourself. You may want to use it for a loved one or, or whatever purpose. But remember this, that the the gist of this Pasha is, is not that, that, you know, how how or what actually happened in the past. The gist of this Pasha, of this reading, is that what's happening today. How can we benefit from it? How can we use the situation to our benefit? That is the gist of this, of this particular portion of Torah in our lives. And the Master Yeshua's words are very relevant at this time of the year because there are many hurting people. I mean, there are many hurting people in the world many hurting people in the world, and we maybe can become good counselors to those people. Maybe we can become good healers to those people that are hurting in the world. Rather than being critical, if you were a helper, if you help somebody to, you know, have something, then wouldn't be, then you would be a healer. You see, this is the thing. This is the thing that we need to understand, is that we need to remove ourselves from the path of, of, you know, being critiques all the time. Uh, okay, so I have somebody who's asking a question. Rabbi, keeping something for the future didn't help those who were trapped in Sodom or the Jews in Jerusalem when the Romans attacked other people of and other people on Noah's time. Well, let me tell you, actually it did. I think, again, again, you, you may be misreading history. People who were actually in, uh, in a uh, time of Sodom, God removed those people that were, that were in Sodom and Gomorrah that He wanted to save. Lord's family being one. So there were wise people there. There were people there that God wanted to remove, and He did. So God would have removed every person He didn't want in the judgment. Secondly, Jews in Jerusalem. Now, before the Romans attacked, I know at least eight families, and I'm talking about 2017, 2018, and even Rabbi Kifa is the one who referred that person to me. And Rabbi, do you remember that man called Abraham? He came out of 2,000 years ago, before the Romans attacked and killed Jews, eight families left Israel, and they ended up in what was then India, what today is Pakistan now. And that man is my student, by the way. So no, you're quite wrong about history. God did show people, and there were many families who left ahead of the Romans attacking Israel, and they saved their lives. Today, those families are thriving. You know, from eight families, there are probably now maybe a hundred families living over there. In Pakistan, at least 20, 30 families, 12 family came out of Israel. They're living there. So it's nothing to do with it. So you're completely wrong about your literally, you know, understanding that, oh, savings have nothing to do with it. You're completely misguided. <laughs> See, this is one of the misguided things. They think, oh, savings have nothing to do with it. Of course it's everything to do with it. Everything to do with it. Because only those people say it who are not of that mindset. So savings is not just about saving money. Savings is about many other things. How about where you live in five years' time? How about where your children grow up? How about which school they go to? A lot of this is all about saving. You know, to, 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 to you, it might just be money, but I'm not just talking about money here. It could be planning. Where you want to put your family in five years' time? Where should your family be in ten years' time? That is planning. That is what is called saving. So saving is a very wide word. You know, so don't mistake it just for a few dollars the movie for a few dollars more. It's not for a few dollars. It's about where you place yourself in five years' time, or ten years' time. That is called saving. What I decide today for myself and my children will affect my family in twenty years' time. That is saving, by the way. And it doesn't always have to do with money. Money can be part of it, but it doesn't always have to do with money. It's to do with direction in your life. 
and I already have that direction. Rabbi Kipa knows which direction I'm going in, <laughs> and Rabbi Kipa is close behind me. And guess who is Rabbi Kipa following? Ask him and he'll tell you. So saving is not just money saving, it's purpose, direction, and where you're going to place your children in the future. It has everything to do with money, my friend, everything. Your soul in relation to salvation and money is everything to do with it. Your salvation is of no benefit to your next of kin if you are going to live an ignorant, <coughs> or stupid life. Really. If your salvation is all about just mumbo jumbo of, you know, a few words and you think that's it, it's done. No. Salvation is not about that. Salvation is about saving your soul and your family's soul and putting them in a place of, of protection. Of, of abundance. That is what salvation is about. You know, to most Christians today, they're ignorant of this. To them, salvation is go to church on Sunday and recite a formula. That is not salvation, my friends. That is ignorance. We don't follow ignorance. So with that, with that, I'm going to pass over to Rabbi Kiva and uh, to Dao for listening. Shabbat Shalom and Shalom Shalom to you. Uh, okay, uh, tada for that, Hakohin, and uh, what a, what a wonderful lecture! Uh, right to the meat and potatoes, right to the point. If I could be heard, can I get a one? Want to make sure I'm coming in crystal clear. Uh, firstly, uh, tada for that, Oliver. Uh, yeah, tada, Hakohin as well. Shabbat shalom to all of you. Happy Hanukkah to all of you as well, and uh, uh, shalom shalom to you. For some of you who are, uh, you know, in other spheres of the world, depending on w which direction the Earth is tilted, you know. Uh, Shabbat Shalom and Shalom Shalom to you as well. So, yeah, to Daha Kohin for that, uh, again, a uh, wonderful lecture, uh, wonderful instruction that we can take and use and utilize and put in our tool bag to utilize uh, in our purpose and direction. As we all desire to have purpose and we all desire to have direction, I hope we aspire to do it as well. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, why do people fail? Because, because of lack of what? Knowledge, lack of understanding, lack of vision. You all must have vision for yourself. You all must have a purpose. Uh, whether I agree with your purpose or not, or the next man next to you agrees with your purpose or not, that, that's of no circumstance. But uh, I would encourage all of you to have a purpose. You see, how many of you like to get up? You know, you wake up in the morning and you're ready to go. You're, you're ready to go. You, you, you anticipate a great day ahead. You know, how many of you wake up with that kind of attitude opposed to those that wake up? And, you know, you, you, know you, you basically have to get a crane to get them out of the bed. You see, this this is a true telltale sign. Let's look at the facts on the ground of a of, 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 of person that has a purpose. If you don't have a purpose, you don't have a plan, you don't have a vision, you don't have nothing driving you, then you're going to be that person that needs a crane to get you out of the bed in the morning. And you, you dread getting up in the morning, you see. So I think that's important to understand. You know, you may not understand that, oh, well, well Rabbi, you, you probably put a name on it for me today, but I understand it was purpose. I didn't understand it was purpose or, you know, purpose or uh, a, a plan or you have a drive about you, but this is exactly what it is. And this is how you uh, 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 really understand, <laughs> you know, really understand that you do have a drive and you do you do have a, a direction that you're going in. Uh, well said, Hakohin. Again, I have to say, well said, son of Aaron, because I, I think it's very important that you do have a, a purpose. You do have a a motivation you do have desires dreams and aspirations and you cannot wait to get out of the bed in the morning to bring you one step closer two steps closer to your goal to your purpose some of you have many purposes and that's great but I would encourage you not to uh, <coughs> overwhelm yourself but to take put all maybe it's a good 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 assessment for you to do today it's a good evaluation is to take all of your your dreams, your desires, and put them in a circle. Or take them outside and put them all in a circle. But then take that one that will help fulfill all the rest of them and concentrate on that one. Because sometimes we get overwhelmed. We don't want to overwhelm ourselves. Is that we want to accomplish a lot of things. But, I, you know, what, what do they say about Rome? Rome wasn't built in what? It wasn't built in a day. Rome wasn't built in one day. So... You just you begin to knock out and you begin to really focus on that one thing that can that can really as far as your drive whatever that purpose may be. Some of you your purpose may be look, Rabbi, I just want peace. 
I want peace. I want peace. All the other things that are in your box, yeah, they're wonderful, they're marvelous, but at the end of the day, when I surmise everything that's in my box or in my circle, what I'm finding is that I want peace. I want to be happy. I mean, that should be everybody's desire. And i tell you why. Probably one of the greatest reasons why a lot of your miracles are not uh, uh, happening and, and, and your dreams are not coming into fulfillment. You, you want to know why? Is because of that very point. Is that a lot of you are not happy. You have the Eeyore mentality going into a miracle, going into a dream, going into a desire, going into a want. Your thought process is like Eeyore mentality. Oh, yeah. One one day I'm blessed. I'm the blessed people. One day God is going to come take me home. One day, I, you know, in the by and by. But until then, I'm going to... Oh, I'm so happy. I'm so happy chappy. And this is just the way you think. Your thought process is, is that of not to, of, of, of happiness, but of just depression, of just downcast, distraught. You see, you need to go into it with every day. You know, this is one of the greatest reasons why people are not successful in life, in marriage and relationships. And you're right, Akoin, it's just not all about money. But how many of you know, in 2018, you need money to survive? You need money to really be a blessing because, you know, it requires money to eat. Last time I checked, you had, you know, you have to go to Walmart. What are you going to pay with? Your deeds? Oh, yeah, I've done many great deeds today. So can you, can you, you know, you know, ring up this $300 worth of groceries and just, you know, put it on my deed credit card? Oh, it doesn't work that way. They want, they want. Uh, money from a, a banking institution, a credit card from some somebody's banking institution, or credit union, or whatever, financial institution. See, these are the things that we have to look at. You see, again, I appreciate this man's uh, you know statements that he was making because what it's giving you a great lesson on humanity and on the, stu the, the, the to study nature. And as you students of nature and students of humanity, you understand is that some people, like Akohin said, he, this man was a great example, man or woman, I don't know, this person was a great example of somebody living in a fishbowl. What a great analogy. You live in a fishbowl and you can only swim as far as the fishbowl will take, take you. And you don't see what's going on in the bigger picture out here because you're only in the fishbowl. And greatly due to the conditioning that we've been placed in. Is that everything that deals with, you know, putting away of, of, uh, of, of wealth has to deal with money. And that's not necessary, necessarily the case. Because how many of you know is that wealth is also in your health? How many can consider that? Because guess what? If you're not healthy, I can guarantee you, you won't be wealthy. Why? Is because you're so, a lot of people that are, <laughs> you know, are not healthy, their focus is on the, they're mostly at most most for the most part they're downtrodden. They're so focused and worried about their worry. You see, when you're not healthy, you always worry. You worrying about this, that, the other, and the third. Am I gonna live tomorrow? I'm gonna die. Some people are afraid of, of death. They fear death. Oh, I'm gonna die and all they focus on is death. All they focus on is the negativity. Oh, I'm gonna die. I got all these bills, blah, blah, blah. I can't pay this. My health is bad. You see, so when we talk about putting away, uh, you know, those things that are important, you know, your, your, you know, your, your, your mindset, your mentality, your, your physical, you know, health is, is concerned. And then also, yes, your prosperity, your possessions, that's, that also plays a key in it as well. Because you can't be in service to the God of Israel, you know, in a soup line. And no offense for those that are in soup lines. But what service are you giving to your family when you can't even feed them? I mean, the great lesson is happening to keep up in your bait this week going forward. This is my daughter. She just don't know how to love. She don't know how to love. She don't know what love really is. She's She's never really looked love in the... You know, love to her is, is just non-existent. She's just never, she's 14 years old, 15 years old now, and, and she don't even know what love is. 
And so she's getting a great lesson on truly what love is because a lot of people don't know. And my daughter, I raised my hand to that when I called you talking about a lot of people don't even know what love is. That's so very true. Have no clue about what love is. Here's the example in your face. I'm going to give it to you right now. Uh, one, of, one of the responsibilities of my daughter is to take care of Pharaoh's feeding. Pharaoh has a feeding time at 6 o'clock p.m. He gets fed every day. Lottie dottie. Pharaoh gets fed once a day that time, 6 o'clock p.m. That's the responsibility of my daughter to feed Pharaoh every day at 6 o'clock p.m. My daughter likes to play with Pharaoh. My daughter tells Pharaoh that she that she really loves Pharaoh. It pats him on the back, wags you know, Pharaoh wags his tail. Everybody's happy, but Pharaoh's not happy because she's telling my dog Pharaoh that uh, I love you, Pharaoh. But again, at the same time, she's not feeding Pharaoh. So Pharaoh is saying to her in, in dog language, "Where's the love? You say you love me, but you're not feeding me." You see, because Pharaoh went several days without getting any food because my, my daughter, one day she was asleep, next day she just totally forgot because she's so overwhelmed with school books, this, that, the other, and the third, so she says. Much things are more important than feeding Pharaoh every day at 6 o'clock p.m. So, uh, you know, great lesson this week in teaching my daughter what truly love is and just so she can really understand what love is all about. Now, my goodness, she's feeding Pharaoh before, before 6 o'clock. Last night she came about four thirty. Ah, Dad, did Pharaoh eat? I'll oh, never get him some food. She has to learn how to be. She said, "Well, yeah, Dad, and now I'm learning to be responsible." But more importantly, you're learning how to love. This is what love is. You say you love somebody. You know what love is, Miss Baha? Love is service. Service outside of yourself. That's what love is. A level of love. Hakohin's. A foundational level of love is that you must love yourself, and that's so very true. You must look yourself in the mirror and say, my goodness, you find like red wine in the sunshine. You must love yourself first. But that second, second level is service outside of yourself. That's what love is. So my daughter is learning, oh, if I say I love Pharaoh with my lips, that does me no, no service. I must show Pharaoh I love him by feeding him every day at 6 o'clock and not forgetting. Not forgetting to feed him. I can't forget to feed Pharaoh, feed Pharaoh because I love Pharaoh, my dog. I love him very much. So that was really eye-opening -open, to her. And what a great lesson to learn, right? How much more so? You say you love your family, but yet you can't put food on the table. What is that? You see, love is service outside of yourself. When you can serve other people. Why do you think our ancestors were, were in, in the service field? Abraham on down the line. They were in the service field. Why? Because they were digging water wells. That's the service to, outside of yourself. Because you, you dig in these water wells not just to, you know, Make a conglomerate and hold out of water for yourself, but you're feeding, you're giving waters to others. As well as, do you know our, our, our forefathers were in the what? They were in the food business, right? They had, our forefathers had the meat market cornered. You don't believe me? How many of you can agree with me? Our forefathers had the meat market cornered. <laughs> read our history. You better go and read our history. Raising goats and sheep and having herds of them, cattle, ox. I mean, my goodness, we, 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 in abundance. Cornered the meat market as well. Why? Is it just only for themselves? No, I'm pretty sure they were feeding others. They were in service of feeding, in the service of feeding others. So truly what love is, service outside of yourself when you can learn how to serve. How can I serve you? Not what's in it for me. My name is Jimmy. How much can you give me? If your name is Jimmy, no offense. But to be in service outside of yourself. To help the next man to you. This is what I see right now in this, in, 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 you know, the Christian holiday season right now. Is they believe in serving others at this time. What a great thing. You think I'm going to discourage that? I'm like, oh yeah, great. Baruch Hashem. Praise Jesus that you do this. To be in service to other people. Truly, this is where love is, Mishpah. I love Pharaoh. 
And believe me, Pharaoh gets the best care in the world. Believe me, he does. I give him the best care in the whole of the world. Best care. How many of you in this room had laser surgery? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Pharaoh gets the best care. Best care. Bar none. He will have a long life. I know he will because why? Pharaoh's very loyal to me. And I just don't give him that loyalty because he gives it to me back. Because that's 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 love with conditions. But we need to learn today is to condition to love. You see, because we've been conditioned to give out, to delve out, give out what we get, right? You're going to get what you give. You're going to get what you give. you giving me this, I'm going to give it right back to you. Tip for tap. This is why we can't get on. You see, because so, some people are so in the fishbowl when it comes to love. The first thing, just like I Kohen told you in this lecture, the first thing they do is they associate love with getting under the sheets. Man, that's fishbowl mentality right there. That's fishbowl theology. If you think love is just in the sheets, under the sheets, on top of the sheets, however you do it, swinging from a, a Tarzan pole, however you have it going on in the bedroom, that's your business. Nurse Betty costume, however you do it. But love is so much bigger than that. Love is service outside of yourself. Outside of the fishbowl, what are you doing? Awesome. Awesome understanding when you grab hold of it. You take it and run with it. You Truly, your light will never diminish. It will illuminate even stronger. Rabbi Yosef Hilton is saying this. It feels really good to be able to do that. To give, helping others. I get more joy and satisfaction now that I am in the Torah. Oh, indeed you should. See, because it goes back to my opening statement for those of you who have arrived late. Remember, remember, we start 7 o'clock Central Time now. 7 o'clock Central Time is start time. I like to open the room at 6.30 Central Time. Have the room open. 30 minutes of getting together, getting your thoughts right, checking out your, 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 your pal talk and make sure it's functional and working properly. Love is service outside of yourself. Outside of yourself. We truly must understand that. You see, and it goes back to that point, like I was saying earlier for the early birds that came into the room, is that this is when Torah, you see, when Torah becomes real, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a commentary that's in the Hidden Truth He Breaks Scrolls in dealing with this, this history about Yosef, our history here. When Torah becomes real, Is when you truly can begin to love out and, and love by service outside of yourself. You see, because most people today they want to service only themselves. Some people call it selfishness. Many other terms that are used out there, which I don't think is a bad thing, as long as there's a balance to it. But when the scale is only tipped one way, then come on. How can there be justice on the justice scales when the scale is tipped heavily in, in favor of one uh, on one side, you see? Yes, we are to be selfish at times. You see, because you have to learn to be, you can't be, your, your scale can't be tilted. Many people have been taken advantage of, and I may say this, and, and some of you may totally understand where I'm coming from. Many people have been taken advantage of this because... They are, their scale is tipped, tilted 100% towards selflessness. And folks, humanity takes your selflessness for a weakness and exploits that. How many of you know what I'm talking about? 
because your tail your your scale is tilted so far over to selflessness you just all about oh i'm gonna just give all of my things and i'm gonna do all of this man people are lining up to take advantage of you they take your selflessness and before you know it you're in that soup line no offense to those of you who are in the soup line by the way but you're in that soup line because you have given away all that you have. You have given and given and given. And, and you realize, wow, I'm getting nothing back in return. I'm supposed to be happy. But I gave away everything and I'm, 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 I'm stuck like Chuck and I'm broke. And my life is not complete. And I don't have anything. I don't even have my house anymore. Because I was so selfless. No, you see, because you have to balance that, that, that selflessness out with what? On the other side of your scale, you need to be selfish. You need to learn to love yourself. You need to take care of yourself. You need to care for your health. You need to care for your wealth, your prosperity. You need to care for your possessions. I'm the possessor of a great dog named Pharaoh, a rhymer whiner name is Pharaoh. I'm going to take care. That's my possession. I'm going to take care of my possession. I'm going to care for it. TLC. Tender loving care. Service to my dog. Not my dog service to me. I'm going to service my dog. How much more so? Service to my wife. Service to my daughter. Service to my family. Service to my children to come. Service to you. In service to my teacher, Hakohim, forever. Elolam it. Next life to come. Baruch Hashem. Look forward to it. Service. Mishpaha. Not many people want to hear that. They want to hear about love, though. They want to hear about love. But make change the love to service, and you'll see crickets in the room, and you'll see people running away like the apocalypse is coming. Like they just missed the rapture. I want to hear that. Uh, can you restate the question, Rabbi? Uh, you talk about service. Uh, can you rephrase that in another way? What can I do for you? What can I do for you? How can I help you become a better person? How can I make your day? It could be as simple as, how can I put a smile on your face? How can I make you happy? Because I perpetually want to live in a state of happiness. Oh, you're, you're, they're going to foreclose on your house. Baruch Hashem, I'm so happy and grateful that they're foreclosing on my house because that means I'm going to get a bigger one. Even when you think all hell is breaking loose, do like Rabbi Benia. What does he say? He say, when you go through hell, keep walking. Maybe whistle while you're going through there. You see? Baruch Hashem, Master Jesus of Nazareth. Rabbi Yosef Hill is saying, uh, Chief Revi, I hope you don't have to climb uh, 70 steps when you want to talk to Pharaoh. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> Baruch Hashem. Nor have to speak 70 different languages. Baruch Hashem. Because <laughs> the angel hadn't come down to give me the... Uh, you know, to give me the wisdom and understanding on these different languages yet. So me and Pharaoh won't be having too many conversations as he's over here curled up under many blankets. His favorite blanket is a blue blanket, by the way. He loves his blue blanket. Israel blue blanket. He loves it. He curls up with it on his leather sofa. I tell you, he has, he has the life of a king and he will always have the life of the king. It's because I'm in service to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh has serviced me so well. When everybody else and every and he everybody else had left me, Pharaoh never left me. He stood by my side as I stood for my belief. As I stood for what I know is right. Everybody else put me down, slandered me, didn't want to be with me. That was such a great time in my life. Because I began to understand and get to know myself. And I began to understand that I had to apologize to myself first. And I began to love myself. 
and really know what myself liked. Because I spent so many years, just like you, Rabbi Joseph Hilton, so many years giving of self and never being selfish. Because I felt like I had to just give of myself. That I never took care of myself. Never took the time to get to know myself. Spend time with myself. Wow. Service to others. Your service may not be on the scale of the great leaders, as our Kohen was talking about. Those people put in positions of leadership. As, 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 a, as a president, you know, uh, George W. Bush. May God rest his soul. And may he find peace in the next life as well. The, but the role of service is for all of us at some level. Some level. We must serve. You must make that a part of your character makeup. Your identity is service. How will you be remembered? Will they say, oh, he or she was such a servant, servant to all. Help me do this. Always put a smile on my face. Always had a good little joke for me. Always trying to make me laugh. Always making me try to see the better side of life. Always helping me see the good in me. Even though I wronged this person up and down the block, he always or she always looked for the good in me. You don't have to look too far, Mishpaha. Some of you is just as close as your husband and your wife, your boyfriend or your girlfriend, your friends, your family members, sister and brother, your mother and your father. You don't have to look far, Mishpaha. But these are the things that we do have to look at. Love. President uh, George W. Bush. You know what his last words were to his son? The other President Bush. This was his last words before he died. You know what his last words were? He said, I love you. I love you. He left the world saying, he left, left this life saying that. I love you to his son. I love you. I love you. He, he, was, he was setting up his obituaries and everything because, you know, as presidents, and you have to begin to set this up because you don't know if you're going to get assassinated or whatever. So they're putting everything in place like what you want on your presidential plaque, blah, blah, blah. You know what he said he wanted on his plaque? What he's going to have on his plaque, his presidential plaque, that he's president? That he loved his wife very much. That's it. This great leader. That he loved his wife very much. That he loved his wife. He was in service to her. Man, 70 years of marriage. Yeah, there's definitely some love in that. 70 years, Ms. Baha Plus, from what I understand. And his wife had passed, what, six months before he did. So it looks like they would definitely attach that to him, huh? That he loved his wife. This man. You know, I went to war under this president. Desert Storm. I went to war under this president. This man saw the Berlin Wall come down under his watch. History, history, before our very eyes. And do you know what his slogan was? Let me tell you a little bit about this president. You know what his slogan was in his campaign trail? He, uh, he said this, Akohin, you probably remember his saying. He said this, read my lips, no new taxes. That was that president, George W. Bush. He said that. They said George W. Bush will go down as the best one-term president, meaning only four-year president, that America has ever had. Y'all remember his saying? I'm pretty sure. I was in high school when his saying went out. Read my lips. No 
new taxes. Well, guess what? The man had to go against his word. And during his during his tenure as presidency, he actually had to raise taxes. But do you know why he raised taxes? It's because they needed revenue for some services that he was going to put out. And guess what one of them was? He put out the, what is it called? It's for folks that are handicapped. It's this service to where all restaurants, all stores need to have like ramps and stuff and need to be wheelchair accessible. They call it the... One is an act that came out. I can't remember the name of it off bat. I remember them talking about this over and over and over again. And to this day, it was him that had enacted that. The Disabilities Act. That's the name of it. The, the Disabilities Act. There you go. It was the Disabilities Act. That was uh, service to who? Those that are handicapped. That can't get into Walmart. That can't get into these stores because they're wheelchair accessible. They weren't wheelchair accessible. He put this in, he put this in place. So he had to break his own word to be in service to others. Because during the campaign, he said, I'm going to be president. When I'm president, no, read my lips, no new taxes. But they had to raise revenue to fund this particular service to those that are disabled under the Disabilities Act. And that you cannot discriminate against somebody in a wheelchair from getting a position at a particular job. And so his his aides were talking about how you know when they were when they were instituting this law they were coming up with this this act and they were like well Mr President you know this means for surety that you won't win an, a reelection if you you know wanted to do an, another term another four years because you're totally going to go against your word and they said he said well. If I have to go against my word to provide this service for all of these people with disabilities that are in wheelchairs and, and cannot, you know, move around properly, then so be it. Then I'm just a one-term president. Wow. You see, President George W. Bush didn't say, no, I want to live in the fishbowl. It's all about me, baby. Yeah, and I want to be a two-term president. I just don't want to be a one-term president. So it mean, if it means I have to go against my word that everybody in the world over knows, read my lips, read my lips, no new taxes to go against that, my goodness. Had to raise taxes, had to raise revenue to fund the Disabilities Act. What is love? That's the true epitome of love. Service outside of yourself. Self would have been thinking, oh, man, my goodness. I'm not going to raise no taxes because that's what I promised the people. But then once you get into the mix, once you get into the position, you realize it, it takes revenue. Just like all of you must realize, it's going to take revenue for you to take care of your families. You say you love them, it's going to take revenue for you to put food on the table. Dog food is not cheap. Pampers are not cheap. It's going to take revenue for you to buy those you know, baby pampers and baby powder and all the baby clothes. And let's not talk about formula when the bills out. You see, it requires revenue for you to get your your children a proper education. It requires revenue. You have to have money, honey. So we must look at all these factors and examine all these things. And see, we don't need to have the mentality. I'm not going to sit here and read through the history of Yosef and this awesome story about what happened and how Yosef saves, you know, not only Egypt, like I told you, he saves the world. Everybody's hungry. And that includes Israel, by the way. Boy, and how, how many of you are following what's going on in Israel these days? My goodness. I heard there was a, you know, big shooting and that they killed what over sixty people and, and and wounded over over a thousand people with live ammunition. We talking about people. I'm not going to put a name. These are people. How many of you heard about that this week? 
they trying to the media is trying to play that under the radar. Like, oh yeah, we better not talk bad about Israel. These things are going on. So even e Israel had to come to Egypt, just like I told you. Service to others. But none of that would have happened, right? If Joseph would have been fishbowl theology, feeling sorry for himself. Oh, you see, my brothers played me. My brothers played me. Now I'm locked up in this prison. I had all these dreams, but... Don't look like nothing gonna happen good here from prison. My brothers can't bow down to me from prison. Oh, what do you mean? The king wants me to help him? Well, I, I you know, I, I, I don't know because you know he's got to meet my conditions. Is he is he a Hebrew Israelite? How does he say God's name? Does he even serve my God? Conditions. Here we go. Many today will love only if conditions are met. How many of you know people like that? Many will love today. I'll service you, but you're going to have to service me. Did you service me? Because if you didn't service me, I'm not going to service you. Many people today, many people will love only if conditions are met. <laughs> How many of you even have a clue what that means? Pretty sure all of you do. Because that's the way we were conditioned to be. You don't love me, I don't love you. You hate me, I hate you. That's the way we were brought up to be. You see it all on YouTube. Oh, if you don't say God's name this way, you're not a, you're not a Jew, you're not a Hebrew. You are heathen. You are the synagogue of Satan. Oh, if you're white, you're not right. And if you're black, you're cursed. Well, where is that? What does that leave? You? What does that leave? You? If they if they if that theology is true, if you're white, you're not right, and if you're black, you're cursed. My goodness. What happens if you mulatto brown? <laughs> you know, what what happens if you Carmel Carmel Brown? Man, my goodness, you! I guess you have the worst of both worlds in their understanding. They love with conditions. Look at Joseph; he was in service to the king. He was in service to to Egypt. Yet, what are we told today in these nations? Oh, separate, segregate. We must, no, we're supposed to be in service to this great shepherd nation. We're not supposed to say, just think what would have happened if, if Joseph would have just shut it down. And he just segregate. No, uh, king, you're a heathen. You're going to hell. You don't serve the God of Israel. You're going to hell. I, I, I can't help you. My God is not for you. You see, but what we learn, let's read it here. I'm not going to stick too long, but I, I must read this footnote that's in the hidden Ruby Brace Scroll. Because it, it, it's so relevant. Look at Genesis chapter 41, verse 15 and 16 for understanding, for more understanding. Because we're always trying to understand it more, right? And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. And I have heard it said of you that you can understand a dream to interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, uh, Pharaoh, you're not a uh, Hebrew. I don't have time for you. You're a heathen. You're going to hell. You're going to bust hell wide open. You're an adulterer. I don't have time for you, Pharaoh. Get thee behind me, Satan. You're of Satan. You're a synagogue of Satan. Is that what it says in the Torah? Genesis chapter 41, verse 16. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not me. Elohim will give Pharaoh an answer of shalom. Now, there's a footnote here in the Hidden Trophy Break Scrolls. You listen via YouTube. If you don't have the Hidden Trophy Break Scrolls, please add them to your library. Please, they will really help you. You can purchase them on Amazon.com. 
the hidden truth of Brave Scrolls. This is the best Bible in the world. Now look at the footnote that said here. Even though Pharaoh was an unbeliever, listen closely now, Yosef does not want ill for him. This is the heart of a Hebrew, the fulfilling of the commandment. This is demonstrating the letter and the spirit of love, your neighbor as yourself. In reality, when Torah becomes real, wow, that right there made the Vegas neon lights come on. When Torah becomes real to you, to me, will we're able to demonstrate the letter and the spirit of love your neighbor as yourself. Why? It's because Yosef, just like we, need to become in service to the king. I'm in service to the king, Pharaoh. Pharaoh the king. I'm in service to Pharaoh. I'm in service to my neighbor. I'm in service to humanity. I'm in service to you. And I'm so happy and humble to be in service. When Torah becomes real, I'm telling you, Mishpaha, say that to yourself ten times. When Torah becomes real in your life, my goodness, my goodness, I, I tell you, this is, this, is, this is good stuff. This is when Torah becomes real. As, as stated in the footnote, this is reality. Reality 101. Oh, no, I'm not going to do anything for you, heathen. You put that Christmas tree up, you're going to hell. You don't read what it says in Jeremiah. You're of the heathen. Your father's a heathen. You're going to be a heathen because mama said you're a heathen. You're going to hell. So judgmental. Yet, we're supposed to love. Just as I he told you. But Rabbi, I don't know how to love. Service. What do you mean? Helping others. We, we, we have to get to the meat and potatoes. Oh, Pharaoh goes on his daily Shabbat walk with the wife. He's very happy. We must be in service. Outside of ourselves. Well, Rabbi, I, I serve myself. Well, how about trying to serve others? And just like the footnote says, y'all forbid, is there anyone in this room that wants ill will towards any anybody? You don't want ill will towards anyone. Right? This is why I watched the services of the president, George W. Bush. And I was like, wow. I see the Master Yeshua and I see the... The God, uh, creator of the heavens and the universes, not wanting ill will for any of any of humanity. When I look at these religions, yeah, they don't have the revelation like I have, and so be it. I got to remember, I'm a sojourner in this land. They're not going to understand my God the way I do. But I see built into that in these religions, mercy and grace. And true love for all of his creation. Because as you and I both know, is that there are a lot of good Christians in this world. Good people. Right? Put up a capital C if some of you know. There are a lot of good Christians in this world, man. Just good, down to earth, good people. Just good. I'm telling you. Some of them, just good people, man. They're just good people. Good, kind-hearted, mean, well for you, will help you out. They love God. They're a believer in Jesus. And you're like, wow. To die for those responses, by the way. Good Christian folk. Good Catholic folk. Just good people. They just don't understand God the way you do. So be it. But what's the commonality in these people? Is that they love Jesus. They have a love and an affinity for Jesus. 
and so be it. That is what brings us together. And not only that, is that they demonstrate and they execute their, their love, the service that they give you. Oh, goodness. So you think for a minute that I have ill will against any of these people? My goodness. I let, I let the master Yahweh be judge and jury because his judgments are going to be just and fair and right. I firmly believe we all are going to be quite shocked who we see in the kingdom of heaven. We're going to be quite shocked. Right? How many of you understand what I mean? We're going to be like, well, how the heck did so-and-so get it? <laughs> how the heck? I've been doing all these bump did this, that, the other, and so-and-so gets in too, but so-and-so didn't do. You see, because you're judging so-and-so with the Torah standard. How many of you understand it? There are going to be different standards of judgment. I hope you all understand that. Humanity is not going to be judged on the Torah standard. When a lot of humanity, I mean, how many of your forefathers that have passed never heard of the Torah? You think they're going to be judged with a Torah standard? I'm going to give you some comfort today. Some of you think, well, I have a father that passed, grandmama, grandpa, uncle, aunts that passed. They never heard of this Torah. They never heard of the laws of Moses. They died in Christianity. They died in Catholicism. They died in Islam. They died in whatever religion that they died in. You think they're going to be held accountable to the same standard as the knowledge and understanding that you know this day? Of course not. But yet, while we walk in this earth, we, we love to hold them accountable to the same standard that you have. That's not fair and that's not just. And that's definitely not right. So we must stop that. And in all things, look for the positive. Look for the good in all. That's what you must do. I see redemption. I see where, you know, you know, in these religions, how, you know, a, a way has been made. I see it. I'm start, I'm understanding it, and I'm, I'm continue to understand it. The measure of their belief in the Master Yeshua. Well, Rabbi, they're not keeping the Sabbath. See, there you go. You're holding them to what? The Torah standard. Rabbi, they over there eating the pork chop sandwich. Oh, you see? You're holding them to the Torah standard. Let's not talk about what they're not doing, but let's talk about what they are doing. Do they treat you fair? Do they wish ill will against you? Are they helping you? Have they been beneficial to you? Think about these things, Mishpaha. Think, think about it for a minute. What Truly, what is love but service? But kindness towards one another? Irrespective of belief system. At the end of the day, we all bleed red. We all are, are breathing in uh, uh, oxygen and blowing off what? Carbon dioxide. We've all been given some measure of dominion over this earth at some capacity. So why not we all just try to get along like Rodney King said, live together. Come, we all just can't get along. That's important to understand. After receiving a beating by the law enforcement, how come we all just can't get along? At the end of the day, maybe we all can't get along. Because just like you have good in the world, you have to have bad. But I, I desire and aspire to be on that side of the good. Not the bad and the ugly, but the good. So, seeing the bad helps me be more good. 
makes me appreciate what is good. Some of you, you look at your bad, and that's all you see. It's bad, bad, and bad, and you stay in bad. But look at your bad to help you appreciate the good, and then keep it moving for the good, for the common good. Andrew Carnegie, one of the richest, one of the richest men of his time. You know what he did? He gave away majority of his wealth, ninety-five percent of his wealth. He gave it away for the common good of humanity. How many of you have you heard of Carnegie Hall for the con com for the for the common good of humanity? Amongst all the other libraries and amongst all the other foundations that the Carnegies just give money away every year. Still doing it. That would be like Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos, right? He dies and he gives away all of his money. 95% of it. He gives it away for the common good of humanity. Wow! Because just like Andrew Carnegie said, he said, what good is it for you to be wealthy? What good is it to live wealthy and to die wealthy is no good in it? Think about it. To live wealthy and to die wealthy, there's no good in dying wealthy. Because the money's not going with you to the next life. So what did he do? He gave a majority away majority of his money away for the common good of humanity. The Jeff Bezos of his time. The richest man in the world. The steel magnet. Some of you right now, majority of you are uh, benefiting right now from, 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 from his steel. Because you probably have it in your house in some kind of way, shape, form, fashion. Or in your apartment for sure. Some steel is somewhere in there. For the common good of humanity. Question for you today is, what are you doing for the common good of humanity? Can we say that Andrew Carnegie demonstrated love? Absolutely. Absolutely he did. President George W. Bush went back on his word. Oh, read my lips. No new no taxes. But he went back on his word for the common good of humanity. So this is why we have the Disabilities Act today. And, and, and as you go about your six days of labor, look around at these grocery stores, malls, any kind of place of business. And tell me if you don't see a ramp there. A ramp that some kind of way, has some kind of handicap accessible. I know all of you know you, you see the handicapped parking spaces that we have? You, you thank President George W. Bush for that. And some of you, you need to quit being naughty and parking in the handicapped spots. <laughs> Stop being naughty. That's for people who cannot walk a far distance to get to their location. Maybe they're in a wheelchair, so they need... They, I know, how many of you haven't seen a candy, handicap accessible place? I don't know, how going? do they do this in the U.K.? Do they have handicap accessible areas right up in the front of establishments so people can go in and, and do their necessaries? Those that are in wheelchairs and things like this. Disabilities Act is here in America. Akoi says, yes, they have handicap uh, areas. Service outside of self. This is love. And don't do just like my daughter did, Miss Baha. Oh, I love you, Pharaoh. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I love you when it's convenient, on a condition that I feel like loving you, on a condition. I'll take you for a walk, Pharaoh, on a condition that, you know, I feel like taking you for a walk today. Don't love that way. Make love your responsibility. Make it a part of you. Show your love by your service. I love you. I'm going to feed you. Hakoin, he mentioned earlier, well, how do you show love? You know how my wife shows love to me? Man, I come home. I have some tea waiting on me. I have food, hot food waiting for me. You know, my wife shows. I see her that she loves me. She serves me my plate. <laughs> how many of you get that? 
I can serve the plate of food. Wow. I just served food. That's love. You know my wife showed me love? She's scrubbing my back in the shower. Wow, that's love. You see? My wife always tells me, oh, you have it so easy. You you only have, <laughs> she says it like this, and she's joking. She says, hey, you men, you only have five minutes. <laughs> you, 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 you only have five minutes uh, to create the baby. But I have nine months. <laughs> That's love. That's love. Service. What is love to you, Mishpaha? See, some of you have fishbowl love. It's only in this fishbowl. It's only what happens in the bedroom. I submit to you today, the majority of love are going to happen outside, uh, outside the sheets. You see? True love. I know my wife loves me because she she just smiles at me. And she looks me in the eye in just such a way. I see it. Her love is just revealed to me. And I have the son of Aaron to thank for that. Pakohim. Because now I, I know what love really is now. It took me many years. I can't remember what which book I read read this about. But it was talking about uh, wisdom. How many of you want more wisdom? Do you know, I read in this book, they were saying in this book that wisdom, right? You don't get wisdom until you're in your 40s and 50s. Men, listen to this. And I, and I believe this holds true. I firmly believe this. Is that wisdom, you're not able to really see wisdom as what it really is until you're in your 40s and 50s. Women, listen to that. Men as well. You want a wise man, women? What age do you need to be looking at? Hakohin, I know you can probably see some truth in this as well. Is wisdom d truly doesn't come until you're in your 40s and 50s. This is when you get wisdom. True wisdom. And you can see wisdom for what it really is. You men in this room, you're probably saying the same thing. Rabbi, that's true. That's right. I mean, I come, I, I, I'm more wiser at that time, you know, than any other time in my life. It's like wisdom, it's like I can understand that I understand. I know that I know. Wow. Your forties and your fifties. So women, what 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 you want a wise man? You're praying for a wise man, and I guarantee you a forty or fifty year old was brought your way and you rejected wisdom. <laughs> oh Rabbi, what a wise man. Well guess what? He's not gonna come in your twenties, I'm telling you. Men, I want you to be honest, like you always are. How many of you in your 20s, you were wise? How many of you in your 20s, you can say, Rabbi, I was wise in my 20s. How many in your 20s, you say, oh, yeah, Rabbi, I was wise. There's crickets in the room, by the way, for you listening via YouTube. Well, Yahanan says, he says that he was wise. I was not wise, but wait. <laughs> I said, I was not wise, but wait. <laughs> Indeed. I was not wise either. I think I, I think I was just running. I, I was I was running on hormones <laughs> in my twenties. I was definitely running on hormones. I was I was fueled by hormones for sure. But wisdom, no. I would consider myself. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, uh, full full hormone octane octane hormone. I guess you could say. But wisdom, wisdom comes in our 40s and 50s. Think about that for a minute. 40s and your 50s. You're just a spring chicken in. This is when you really begin to wise up, when you really begin to get clued up on life. And I can see that as I look and I, I look on, I'm seeing that. I'm seeing that. Because correct me if I'm wrong, Hakohim. When you received the revelation that you received in that bank, you were in your late 30s, right? Beginning in your 40s, if I'm not correct. Think about that for a minute. Yep, yep, 35. I see that. That holds true. That holds true. 
Akoin said, but I didn't understand it even then. But when that, when when he when he wrote those hidden truth we pray scrolls, I think you were in your forties when it was complete. Well, the Abrahamic faith, Nick Simon study scriptures. I think that was in his forties. Wisdoms, wisdom comes in your thirties and your forties. Yep, there you go. Wisdom in that. I, I firmly believe there's some great understanding in that. So women. I mean, if you're praying for a wise man, but you want a young man, uh, the two don't fit. A 40-year-old man is still a young man. But because you live in the fishbowl age, oh, 40 years old, 50 years old, oh, that's an old man. No, 40, 50-year-old man, that's a spring chicken. That's a spring chicken. But because you live in the fishbowl age, you want that 20-something-something. Something. And basically what you're going to have is to be a woman raising a child. How many of you have been through that, women? Is that you took a man, but you realized you had a boy. Or you even had a baby. <laughs> you, you had a baby still taking the breast milk. You see, that happens. To of that, I thought, right, that happens. Men in their, I'm telling you, in their 40s and their 50s, they're spring chickens, man. Spring chickens. But, because you're in the fishbowl age, they're going to tell you, oh, no, these men are through, man. They're done. They're done. Hakori said, I'm actually better now than I was at 40, even in health, wealth, wisdom, and youthfulness. Personal testimony. There you go. There you have it. There you have it. Because when you attain wisdom, my goodness, and he's 55 now, so you see, when you attain wisdom, I mean, you know what? Wisdom is the fountain of youth. Everybody, Ponce de Leon, everybody looking for the fountain of youth. You know where it is? It's with wisdom. Those that are wise will understand. Wisdom is the fountain of youth. I'm telling you, I am telling you. Wisdom is the fountain of youth. You're spring chickens when you get wisdom. You attain wisdom? Ooh-wee. Ooh-wee. That's all I can say on that one. When you attain wisdom, it's the fountain of youth. It is. It is, it is the fountain of youth. I coin said, I wish I had this wisdom at, at 35, really. Oh, indeed. Indeed. Indeed, Hakoim. Indeed. But when you look at our ancestors, right? They didn't start getting on. I mean, 40 and 50, they were just getting on with their lives. Go look at our history. Read our history. Study our patriarchs. They were just getting on with their lives at that age. They, they, they would be considered like, I mean, teenagers. That would be like, I mean, you know, their 60 and 50 was like 18. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They were just getting started. They were just getting started, Mishpah. So we are this day. It's just unfortunate we live in the fishbowl age where they tell you, oh no, you're over, you're, you're 40 and 50, man, you need to start making plans for the grave. Are you kidding me? I'm making plans for children. I'm 49. I'm making children plans. What are you talking about the grave? The grave is going to wait. You see, this is what you must understand. Maturity, forget about it. Seek wisdom. The world hits you with a bunch of maturity. Mom. Oh, you are. It's because they're not wise. Those that are mature are those that are wise. Careful what you pray for, women. Oh, I want a wise man. Yet God has brought you many men your way. And you pass them up because you had, a, you know, fishbowl age mentality. Oh, you that man too old, Rabbi? Are you kidding me? He's a spring chicken. Spring chicken. When Ikusan, never look at my board. Never look at my husband's age when we get married. Never had prejudice about that, but my peers have it. Some regret it. Yeah, 
they use age as a stumbling block. We are 19 years difference. Wow, that's great. That's great. I know you guys will have all the best in life, in this life, in this marriage. I wish you all the best. I desire all the best for your marriage. That's great. So we go back to Yosef. I'm getting ready to close. We go back to Yosef, Mishpaha. We go back to Yosef. Yosef had to, Yosef gave you love and reality. Love and reality. Real. When Torah becomes real, Mishpaha. When Torah becomes real, you'll make statements like the son of Aaron is making here. I can compete with any 25 year old and I will beat I will beat them to it in anything, education, finances, health, fighting, ability, oh, indeed. Always bet on maturity. Indeed, I call you. My desire is that you really begin to understand this. You see, because you live in the fishbowl age, you're missing out on some great relationships. Oh, he too old, according to whose standard? The Gentile standard or God standard? What is old in the God standard? No such thing. Our books tell us what? When his years were complete, I firmly believe the fountain of youth is in, is in wisdom. To attain wisdom, you have to go through some years. Some years. Wisdom is just not given out like, like the candy man, like Willy Wonka gives out like chocolate. It just doesn't happen that way. You must attain wisdom. Wisdom must be sustained over time. Just like a fine wine. It just gets better as you let it age, right? It just keeps getting better and better and better. Don't let age be a stumbling block. Don't let age prevent you from truly missing out on that miracle man, on that dream man that you always wanted. Oh, he too old, Rabbi. Are you kidding me? You better go check yourself. My question to you is, is he a wise man? Not how old is he? Because you don't want to, you know, them youngsters, they're just some knuckleheads. they they knuckleheads at this time. They just don't, they have no clue about life. They're too busy running on high-octane hormones. Instead of high-octane thought. You get a man in his 30s, his 40s, and his 50s, he becomes a thinker. Then he becomes a reader. And he becomes a thinker and a reader. That's what Andrew Carnegie said about his family. He said, my family are, is a family of thinkers and readers. Hint, hint. This is from the, the, the most wealthiest man in the world during his time. A family of thinkers and readers. All of you starting families, you better hint, 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 hint. My teacher used to do that in school. Before she'd give us a test, a pop quiz or something, she'd say, hint, hint, you might want to, hint, hint, you might want to remember that one, hint, hint. That means highlight, put it in neon light, Vegas neon lights and everything, because that's going to be on the test. A family of thinkers and readers. I always want you to think. You need to start thinking again. We've been conditioned in these nations not to think, just to wrote. Oh, pastor said, do. Pastor said, do. Mama said, do. Father said, do. You must think. Become thinkers. Think. Napoleon Hill said what? Think and grow rich. Isn't that what he said? That's the title of his book, right? He said, think and grow rich. Wow. There's validity to that. <laughs> I'm telling you. 
There's validity to it. Think. They would always ask the Master Yeshua. They would always ask him many questions. One of the questions was what? Well, Rabbi, who do you say that you are? What did the Rabbi Yeshua say? Who do they say that I am? <laughs> you see? Because why? He's trying to make you think, so he's at, always asking you questions. You need to do the same. Make people think. People may not don't want to think, but here's where you come in as as the the, the light bearer. Is you make people think. You you help them think. Ask them a question. Oh, they give you a question, you ask them a question. Oh, I love this man, Rabbi. Oh, he's so good. I want to marry this man. Is he wise? See, you make them think wisdom. Think. Have a great Hanukkah to you, B.C. Shalom. And Shabbat Shalom to you, or Shalom Shalom to you, where you are, wherever you're at in the world. <laughs> yeah. These things are important to understand. Seattle, welcome. You're welcome here. They're very important. You see, now you're getting the meat and potatoes of how to live like the Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth. How to live like the Master, Yeshua. How to live like God intended us to live as people. It's going to come out in tidbits because that's how we need to handle it. Because we continue to mature. We continue to grow. We continue to want to demonstrate a life. Of where we condition ourselves to love. And love is not a condition. I'm going to love you. I'll service you. I'll be of service to you only if blah, 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 blah. Only if you have straight hair, if you if you if you of this skin color, if you if you say this, if you drive this kind of car, if you live in this side of town, if you live in this neighborhood, if you eat this particular food. Oh, I can't be of service to you. You have a Christmas tree in your house. You're a pagan. You're heathen. You're going to hell in a handbasket. God will never forgive you. Jesus don't love you. You see? You see where we're going? What happened to love your neighbor as you love yourself? What happened to service? Service. What? Ha that's true love. True love is service outside of yourself. Indeed, what happened to love your enemy? Those that want to be your enemy, because guess what? I don't have any enemies. But some people say I'm their enemy, so so be it. I can't change their thinking. But I'll continue to still show them and demonstrate to them compassion and love and more importantly, peace. Because I'm not trying to go to war with you. So I don't, I'm not trying to go to war so I don't have any enemies, you see. I don't want to war with anybody. Our books tell us that we're shalom makers. Not lawbreakers. <laughs> you know? Love. Should be the motivation for everything that we do. Should be love. But what is love? Some people don't know how to love. They don't know what love is. They just think love is the fishbowl love that happens in between the sheets in your bedroom. No. Love, that's one layer of love. But another layer of love is service outside of yourself. How can I serve you? How can I help you? What can I do for you? Wow, you hear that? Some people think that's a foreign language. Oh, you really want to help me? Huh? You really care about me? Yes, I do. You're a human being just like I am. You're a creator of the heaven, of the creator of the heavens and the universe. You're his creation. Yet everybody wants to be in the kingdom gates of the most highest, but nobody wants to obey the kingdom laws. And at the top of the list is love. I tell you, there's going to be some shocked people that, oh, he made it into the kingdom? How did he, oh, how did she get in? I don't know how she got in. Well, who are you to judge? I'm not judging. I'm not jury. So these are things that we need to look at. Condition yourself to love. 
Condition yourself to love. Don't love with condition. Condition yourself to service. To be of service to others. And that, can, that service, how many of you, can anybody give me an example in closing on how many different ways you can be of service to others? Can anybody, anybody, give me just some examples of how you can be in of service to others. You could have a person that just needs, needs a good joke, needs a laugh. Yeah, you could be a listening ear, indeed. Can be a listening ear. Can be somebody needs a laugh. Somebody that just needs a help up. Somebody may have failed. You you help them get up. You help them. You help uh, somebody across the street. I mean, listening to people. Helping people in any kind of way that would edify them or make them even feel better. Make put a smile on their face when they're walking around with a frown. Just telling somebody hello. I would encourage you. Look them in the eye and say, hello, good morning, how are you doing? I hope you have a great day. Make your day great. Make your day great. Be happy. You know what? I wake up in the morning and I think about that song. That song, I feel good. You hear me? You know that song. Da na 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 na. Feel good. I like to tell people this every day. Have a feel good day. Feel good. That's what I think about. I wake up in the morning. That's the first song coming to mind. I feel good. Da na 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 na. I knew that I would. Oh yeah, I, just like that. Every morning I wake up like that. Pulling the sheets away like Rabbi Benia talks about. Throw the sheets off. I feel good today. You see, because when my thought is about feeling good, I can, I'm, not, I'm not worried about bad health, blah, 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 and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. I don't worry about it because I feel good today. And I tell everybody else around me, come on, let's, let's have a feel good day. You have a feel good day. You make your day great. Oh, but you don't know, Rabbi, my day is lousy, blah, 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 and blah, blah. No, no. Well, you make that lousy day a great day. Make your day great. You can make it. You're, you're many creators. You're many means of the creator. Thus, you create your own environment. You do it. Many of you, you point the finger at so many people, but at the end of the day, you created what is before you right now. You created that. Who else can you blame? You can't blame Mary Poppins. You can't blame Pee Wee Herman. You can't blame Mr. Bean. You got to blame yourself. You create your environment. You need to create a feel-good environment. You need to create a great day environment. Feel good. Have a feel-good day. Another song that always comes to my mind, I, I forget, it's on one of those Minion cartoons, the Minion movies there. And uh, what's that song? So I'm um, happy, 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 happy. Be happy. It does, what good is it to be sad? I like to be happy. So I'm happy. Walk around just happy, happy, happy. Put your house on fire. Oh, but I'm so happy. I'm happy. Because I know I'm going to get a bigger house now. <laughs> so I know I'm going to get a better house now. You see? Stay happy. Stay positive, Mishpaha. Why go through this life negative? Why? Why? Well, well, why? You don't have to. You create your environment. You create that negativity. Go through life happy. Go through life feeling good. And thus you will be. Because what a man thinks that he will be. What do you think? The Master Yeshua, Master Jesus of Nazareth. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, what do you think? What do you think? What do you want? What do you desire? You see? Yeah, life is good. No, I say life is great. I say life is awesome. I say life is spectacular. See, we're going to kick it up a few notches. Rukashim, Master Jesus of Nazareth. Rukashim. So we need to give thanks to the God of Israel always for our ability to be able to think. 
And always remember, you are what you created here. Let's begin to do what? Condition ourselves to love. And not love with conditions, you see. That's important. Many want to serve God, but they can give a flying flute about their neighbor. Where's your service to God then? You want to serve a vertical God, but you can't do nothing parallel. Wow, think about that one for a minute. On that note, we're going to wrap it up. And I wish you all a great Shabbat. Happy Hanukkah to all of you. And uh, enjoy your families and enjoy the festive season here in the nations as they celebrate their, 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 their festivals. And, uh, and, 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 and show service, Mishpaha. Show service. So give thanks to the God of Israel always. Uh, and over to you, Akoin. Any questions at this time, please do. Uh, uh, let us know. Oliver, especially for you as well. I see all that drama that's going on over there in, in, in France. My goodness. Uh, yeah, be, be the light over there and help, help those people see what they can see. And uh, I pray that everything corrects itself out. Maybe, you know, sometimes, you know, just like in everything in life, correction is needed. And some, I think this is a point in, in, in France where there needs to be a correction. Maybe in leadership, whatever, but this is that corrective phase that they need to go through so they can get back on track. And I think these things are healthy. It happens in every, it truly does happen in, in every nation, with that time of correction. It happens in America, it's in our history. We have times of correction where you, you know, things must be, things that have been wrong for a very long time must be made right. You see? Because that's just the nature. That's the laws of life. You have to have a balance. You only be bad for so long, you see. So I, I think that's it's very, very important to understand. So uh, over to you, Hakohin. Any, any, anybody want to give uh, any more questions? Anybody have any concerns? Any questions, concerns? Uh, please let us know. And if not, we'll close it up. I'll turn it over to Hakohin and we'll wrap it up on this end. Shabbat shalom. Shalom shalom to all of you. Happy Hanukkah as well. Uh, yeah, to talk for that, uh, Rabbi Kifa. So just to summarize a couple of points. Uh, one is that we meet a little bit earlier. We are meeting now at uh, 7 o'clock uh, Central Time and 8 o'clock Eastern Time. For those of you who came in late today, you probably don't know that. You may want to write it down and, and, and note it that uh, we, we meet a little bit earlier so that we can finish earlier. That way, you know, people can go and have lunches with their families and get on with the rest of the, the Sabbath day. Um, the other thing was just to just to summarize what is love. First of all, in order to understand love, that uh, we must first learn to love ourselves. That is a premise that we work from. If we do not have that premise worked out, you'll never be able to love anybody. You'll have broken relationships, you'll have family disputes, you have all sorts of problems going on with your parents, with brothers and sisters because you can't love yourself. So at a very basic level, we need to learn to love ourselves. And the second premise is rather than going around forgiving the whole planet, uh, you need to forgive yourself first. And then you begin from there. That's your beginning premise. Love yourself, forgive yourself. And then you can move forward from there. Now, you, some of you may have the conditioning done so negatively in your, against you that you may have to reprogram yourself. And in order to reprogram yourself, you may have to tell yourself daily that you are loved, that you are wanted, that you are worthy, that you are redeemed. You have to tell yourself that daily. Because some of you, as I know, as personal, you know, personal conversations with people I've had, is that they, they, see themselves in a negative light, they are having inferiority complexes, they feel they are not good enough, they have all sorts of personal issues that are preventing them from rising higher. They can't hold on a job, and maybe they don't like the employers that they work with. All of these things are going on because of what you are feeling about yourself. So at the very basic, you need to first say these things to you daily, I am loved, I am wanted, I am worthy, I am deserving, I am redeemed, I am free, and you need to say that to yourself. If you don't say that to yourself daily, then you 
because you're going to have to read, this is what you're doing to reprogram yourself. You may not have another person in your vicinity who tells, who tells you daily, I love you, and probably even if you did have somebody in your vicinity, maybe, you know, some people might think it's just rote to say every day, I love you, but it's actually better to say it than not to say it. I'm pretty sure that, you know, a healthy relationship, they need to be communicated. Uh, by both by deeds and actions and words. You know, all three need to be involved in a healthy relationship. And different people, you know, different different types. There is a, a Christian book which was very popular and uh, I think it still is very popular. It's called The Five Love Languages. Probably pick it up on Amazon or somewhere. And I, I read it years ago. I think it was a Jewish woman that gave it to me to read it. And I, it was a good book. It was a good book. And uh, it talks about what, you know, what attributes different people have. And you have to find your attribute. You know, what is it that you like and how other people can reach, reach you through that. Yeah, that's right, Lanthony. That's a great book. Uh, and I read it uh, years ago. And uh, I still remember the concept that the book spoke about was the five love languages in uh, regarding service. You know, some people, they like the service type. You know, they like a woman that's servile. Some people, you know, they like to be acknowledged. And so these are the different types that the book spoke about that, that people need to work with people on what type of person they are, which will help that person's psychology and to build them up in the right, right, proper way. Also, <clears throat> I want to point out that love, because here is something. You see, we've been conditioned to believe and to understand that love is, is reciprocal. In other words, you know, I'm only going to love somebody if they're going to love me back, or I will only love somebody if they love me first. So love is not like that. Love needs to be unconditional. So... What that means is that when you put out love for somebody, you shouldn't be looking for a return. Because what happens mostly in our society, when we put out love and we don't get love back, people say, you know, oh, well, I'm not going to love that person any longer because they didn't love me. They didn't love me back. Why should I love them? I should waste my time with them. So there's that attitude to deal with. What, you need to, what we all need to understand is that God's love intrinsically at the highest level is unconditional love. So we are working from the premise of the love of God based on no conditions. God did not set any condition on Israel to love Israel. And you can read that in scripture. There is no condition set that says that I will love you only if. So we need to then work from the premise that your love needs to be without conditions. Now, to give you an example, there's a lot of criticism about people who put up trees during Christmas. And, you know, I, I read it, I came across people, and I discussed it, and at one time, at one time, when I was, when I was young in my faith, I was thinking the same way, that maybe, maybe putting up trees is wrong, maybe it's not right to put up trees, you know, and it's bad, and, and it's, it's Santa Claus and all that is bad, and... You know, I was kind of moving into the fundamentalist area at one time. And uh, later I realized as I traveled, as I went to different nations and saw different people, different behavior, different environments, I saw how Christian people live in a real heavy Islamic environments. I realized I actually no, this whole idea, the fundamentalist idea of, of not having a Christmas tree is actually very wrong. And, you know, they, you know the very first person who quoted me, Jeremiah 10, was a scholar from America. And he's a very person, first person, because I think he wasn't really in favor of Christmas. And, and you know, that, that was my first perception of reading Jeremiah 10 and thinking, well, is it tree right? Is it tree wrong? But actually, the whole, you know, years later I realized that that whole concept of Jeremiah 10, trying to apply it to the tree, is totally flawed premise. Because Jeremiah 10 speaks about a nation that, that molds trees into gods to worship them. Well, Christians don't worship trees. You see, the whole premise is wrong. So I realized that actually the premise was wrong. 
and is not the premise. And, and also, in some nations where Christians are persecuted as minority nations, minority people, they have to put up a Christmas tree as evidence and witness of what they believe. You know, that, that to some people is, my goodness, I'd be like, what is that? You know, like, you would never come across that because if you don't leave your, you know, if you don't leave your comfort zone and you don't go to a nation where the, Christ, where the Christians are persecuted, you will never know that. So you need to, in, in order to experience that, you have to go to a nation where the Christians are persecuted. Understand that principle. Go to an Islamic nation. See how the Christians live. See how they are persecuted. And see what they do to represent a witness. Because they are not allowed to preach openly. They are not allowed to carry a Bible in the public places. Like you do in uh, the Western countries. So you need to come out of that thinking. And you know, I sent, I sent about $90 to a family yesterday, I believe it was, yesterday I sent them $90 in the East to a family so they may buy some gifts for themselves for Christmas and put up a tree. Now, I, I actually funded up money for some, for, you know, for some gifts and for a tree. Now, how does that work out? Learn from me, because that tree represents their faith in the Messiah in an Islamic nation. They are not allowed to carry Bibles. They are not allowed to tell somebody, Jesus is my Savior and Jesus is God, because they could get killed for that. But they are allowed to put up a tree, and they are allowed to show that they are celebrating Christmas, and they are celebrating it for Christ. That is the witness you need to make. I made a witness for that, who was the Messiah, in an Islamic nation. That's why I funded that project. Because I decided that this family needs to put up a tree so that her neighbors, the, all their neighbors need to know who they worship themselves. Because all of them worship, the rest of them worship Allah. And they're chasing after Muhammad and his theology. So that is what I'm trying to teach you, is that you need to learn witness by doing. It's no good just talking about, I can talk about this all day, but what's the point of it? It's not helping anybody if I don't do something about it. So I did something. So therefore, this is how this is how we do things. And we need to we need to adopt an attitude of loving others, even when the, you know even when it goes against dogma and fundamentalist theology. It may go against fundamentalist theology. So therefore, we have to. We have to learn at times what love really is. Love, you know, love is unconditional. And I'm not expecting anything back from this family. They're not going to give me nothing for my love. You know, I went over there and I stayed with this family and just out of the street. You know, I, I told you the story of how it happened. I didn't expect anything from them. You know, I wasn't expecting them to, 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 to bring me under their roof. But it happened, so God brought me into their vicinity for a reason. I was to show them the, the, the you know, the, the Kohen of Israel, how the Kohen of Israel, you know, works. And what, you know, miracles and might that God has bestowed upon His Kohanim. So therefore, sometimes you have to, in fact, not just sometimes, many times you have to humble yourself. You have to humble yourself and sometimes you have to hide yourself. <laughs> you don't have to tell people who you are. Sometimes you have to hide yourself and not tell everything. So this is all part and parcel of, of wisdom and understanding. And love is always revealed in in small you know, in small bites. It's not revealed in big big chunks, but it's too much to handle. So it's very important that, you know, during this time of Hanukkah Hashem Yahweh, Baruch Hashem, Master Yeshua, beautiful time it is. I thank Him for this beautiful time that I'm in a free country, that I have a free life, I have freedom to express myself, whereas I know people in other countries that don't have freedom to express themselves. That they could be persecuted, that they could be killed for their faith. And I thank God for that, that I have not, I'm not in that situation. And many of you are not in that situation. So be thankful, be happy, be grateful, enjoy the times with your family. 
enjoy the Sabbath with your families because freedom is, is, you know, freedom is a gift. And a lot of us take freedom for granted. And uh, the, the one thing that you could help, help, help yourselves with is from today, tell yourself that you're not going to complain. Stop complaining. Never complain. And it will, it will change your life to much better when you stop complaining. Start giving thanks for everything. As I, as I said to some other people, I speak to people, many people privately, I say to them, give thanks every day. When you wake up, when you come out of your bed, give thanks to God every day. Give thanks for everything. You know, you have, you have a table laid out for yourself in North America, in Europe. You, 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 you lay a table out for your breakfast. Some people have a hard time putting a cup of, uh, you know, a cup of tea or a, a cup of water on their table. There are places in the world today, there's no water, no fresh water, and we have taps connected in our homes. We just switch the tap on and boom, 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 you got all the water you want in the world. You go to your shower, and all the water you want, and some places don't have water in the world to shower, let alone drinking. I've been to those places too. And I came to appreciate the blessings that God has bestowed upon us, that we are. Shem Yah. What a great, what a great honor. And what a great blessings that we live, what a great abundance we live in. It's like, it's like having a river connected to your tap, to your faucet. You know, you just turn it on and the whole river falls in. So, so, you know, we are, we are, we are, we are, let's not forget that, Israel. We are greatly blessed. Shem Yahweh, have a great day. Enjoy your Sabbath with your families. Until next time, Shabbat Shalom, Shalom, Shalom.